in an undisclosed location, a woman is being tortured. The methods of her abuse are too horrific to be described, and her torturers are death row prison inmates, the absolute worst of the worst. This woman's torture is constant, and procedures are put into place to make sure she never becomes accustomed to the pain. If ever her torturers express sympathy toward their victim, their superiors will have them removed and replaced. If they try to rescue her or put her out of her misery, they themselves will be shot without hesitation. The woman being tortured is known only as SCP-231-7, and worst of all, she's pregnant. The cause of her eternal torture? The SCP Foundation. And you'll be shocked to learn that when all is said and done, these are the good guys. Because if they ever stop their brutal treatment of SCP-231-7, a treatment codenamed Procedure 110 Montauk, she'll give birth to a creature that will destroy the world as we know it. This is just one of the many examples of the objects and entities under the watchful eyes of the SCP Foundation, a mysterious group that strives to achieve greater good by any means necessary, and we do mean any. What you're about to hear is above classified, and be warned. What is heard can never be unheard, unless, of course, the Foundation gets its hands on you. So what is the SCP Foundation? In the most basic sense, the group's mission statement hmm. is right there in the SCP acronym. Secure, contain, protect. It's the task of the Foundation to, in their own words, contain anomalous objects, entities, and phenomena. Things that don't make sense, things that don't belong, things that simply don't fit in with our perception of reality, and some things that pose an existential threat to all human life. They refer to these contained anomalies as SCPs, each of which is accompanied by a number. This is a broad umbrella, as an SCP can range from benign or even actively helpful to downright apocalyptic if ever released. Much like the infamous Men in Black often reported by witnesses in connection with alien sightings, the Foundation works in secret to maintain a sense of normalcy at all costs, knowing the chaos it would cause if any of the anomalies they're harboring ever become public. Take for example SCP-500. To the untrained eye, the object is just an unassuming prescription pill bottle, the kind you'd see in medicine cabinets the world over. But the pills in this humble bottle are unlike any earthly medicine. They can cure quite literally anything, from cancer to a cold within two hours. But at the time of this writing, there are only 47 pills left. The power to cure all disease, a privilege denied to even the richest and most powerful in society. A veritable holy grail. Can you imagine the violence and horror that would break out in trying to obtain them if their existence ever became public? The SCP Foundation works in secret because the collective mind of society just couldn't handle the knowledge of what they're dealing with. They work with the approval of all world governments, effectively placing them above international law. Essentially, there is no human authority above the Foundation, because without the Foundation's work, there would be no humans left to govern. To understand the basic operations of this above top secret organization, we need to delve a little further into that Secure, Contain, Protect slogan. Secure refers to the Foundation's practice of constant global surveillance and observation in order to detect and intercept anomalous activity before it can interact with civilians or rival groups. Contain involves preventing the effects or influence of the anomaly from spreading by either, in their own words, relocating, concealing, or dismantling such anomalies, or by suppressing or preventing public dissemination of knowledge thereof. The latter can involve practices such as using advanced chemical compounds or technologies to delete and then rewrite the memories of infected civilians, or even committing mass murder if necessary to cover their tracks. The SCP Foundation has in the past wiped out entire towns of innocent oh. civilians to prevent dangerous information about the SCP spreading beyond their control. They can take lives at their own discretion and consider almost any crime to be permissible when the alternative is Armageddon. And finally, Protect pertains to all operations meant to protect mankind from the SCPs, up to and including neutralizing and destroying them when possible. Some SCPs, such as the infamous SCP-682, a nigh-indestructible genocidal reptilian, have proved to be almost impossible to destroy. Research is ongoing in many cases, as the Foundation explores any and all possible methods of reducing the threat of more dangerous SCPs. In order to help them categorize the thousands of strange and horrifying anomalies under their watch, the Foundation has created a system that organizes the SCPs based on the difficulty of containing them. The first of the primary object classes is SAFE, pertaining to SCPs that require little if any resources to safely and properly contain. Examples include the previously mentioned SCP-500 pill bottle and SCP-999, a benevolent blob of gelatinous orange matter. SCP-999 has a playful, almost dog-like personality, 
It causes feelings of happiness and euphoria in whoever or whatever it touches. It's even been used by the Foundation as a pacification tool to reduce aggression in other SCPs. The second primary object class is Euclid, which refers to any anomaly that requires more resources to contain completely or where containment isn't always reliable. This is the broadest SCP class, and the majority of sentient, sapient, or autonomous anomalies fall into this category. A Euclid SCP might be something as huge, sprawling, and bizarre as SCP-3008. This SCP appears to be a kind of anomalous pocket dimension hidden inside an IKEA superstore, which is not only significantly larger on the inside by approximately 10 kilometers, but also contains bizarre, faceless entities which can become hostile under the right conditions. A Euclid SCP can also be something as seemingly innocuous as SCP-294, which appears to the untrained eye to be a standard coffee vending machine. However, unlike any other coffee machine, the input system on SCP-294 is a QWERTY keyboard. This SCP can manifest any liquid typed in on the keyboard, from standard drinks like coffee and beer to more esoteric compounds like sulfuric acid and disease-infected human blood. During extensive tests, one subject requested the perfect drink and was given an odorless, lavender-colored liquid. After consuming the liquid, the subject went into a state of euphoric shock. The subject later committed suicide, leaving a note which read, I'm sorry, but at this point everything's just one big letdown. Sadly, subjects dying during tests is not uncommon. The SCP Foundation essentially has limitless resources, including access to countless disposable workers and test subjects. The most common of these are so-called D-Class personnel, which are death row inmates conscripted for the purposes of often lethal SCP experimentation or containment. The next primary object class is Keter, described by the Foundation as anomalies that are exceedingly difficult to contain consistently or reliably, with containment procedures often being extensive and complex. This can either be due to being an extremely volatile and dangerous anomaly or just one that seems to defy known laws of physics or reality, and is thus extremely difficult to understand or contain. The SCP Foundation has a vast number of secret facilities across the globe, and while the Keter-class SCPs are not nearly as common as the Euclid-class, they consume a great deal more resources to safely contain. One particularly terrifying Keter-class SCP is SCP-354, colloquially known by the Foundation employees as the Blood Pond. This SCP is a large pool of non-biological red liquid discovered in North Canada that appears to be a kind of interdimensional primordial soup. What makes this SCP particularly hard to contain as well as extremely frightening is the fact that hostile entities periodically emerge from the pond and must be neutralized before they can escape the containment area. These entities have included a floating black sphere that can fire concentrated beams of deadly radiation, a 15-foot tall reptilian humanoid that seemed immune to gunfire and a homicidal metallic humanoid nicknamed the Terminator by Foundation personnel. The most highly classified primary object class of all is Thaumiel, which consists of SCPs used to contain other SCPs. This can range from SCP-7000-J, a book of Latin incantations bound in dinosaur skin that can summon various other entities, all the way to SCP-4006, which is the entire state of Massachusetts. Thaumiel class SCPs are the most bizarre and esoteric of the anomalies dealt with by the Foundation, but thankfully, they often pose less of an active threat than many of the Euclid or Keter class SCPs. SCPs. Finally, as mentioned earlier, sometimes the SCP Foundation deems an anomaly too dangerous to contain and just needs to destroy it entirely. A terrifying example of a neutralized SCP and a perfect illustration for just how strange and abstract the anomalies dealt with by the Foundation can be is SCP-4991. This SCP manifested as a series of bizarre posts across a number of websites about an apocalyptic event that seemed to be occurring on a different layer of reality and seemed to indicate that a kind of deadly parasitic and carnivorous insect was spreading like wildfire across the globe, causing death and destruction in their wake. The SCP Foundation neutralized SCP-4991 by tracking down, containing, and erasing all infected posts across the internet before it could spread too far. Who knows what would have happened if the Foundation hadn't intervened? As is often the case with SCPs, it's probably best just not to think about. The actual structure of the SCP Foundation is surprisingly transparent, with personnel classification levels ranging from Class A to Class E. Class A personnel are considered vital to the strategic operations of the Foundation and therefore are not allowed to be in direct contact in any way with any of the SCPs due to potential risks. Class B personnel are vital to local Foundation operations on SCP test sites 
and are only permitted to be in contact with SCPs deemed to be relatively safe. Class C personnel are field agents that have far more direct contact with the SCPs and often put themselves at great risk in doing so. Class D personnel, as previously mentioned, are essentially cannon fodder thrown into the jaws of death to discover more about the more dangerous anomalies on the SCP roster. And finally, Class E personnel are personnel that have been already exposed to the potentially dangerous effects of an unknown anomaly. Class E personnel are placed into quarantine until they're deemed fit to return to work or terminated, depending on the results of their observations. In terms of actual roles in the SCP Foundation, the top of the pyramid are the O5 Council members, Class A personnel who have total clearance and oversee all Foundation operations. Below them are Site Directors, who manage the various physical Foundation facilities across the globe and report back to the O5 Council. On site, researchers and containment specialists work together to better understand and combat the anomalies being housed at their particular facility. They are kept safe by the hard work of veteran security and tactical response officers ready to lay down their lives to prevent more dangerous SCPs from ever escaping and reaching developed areas. In the event that an SCP does breach containment and escape or a new one is discovered, field operatives are dispatched by the Foundation to get the situation under control. These will consist of field agents who already operate across the globe and specialized mobile task force operatives. The SCP Foundation has eyes and ears everywhere. Their organization is influential and is embedded in every facet of society, ready to strike and suppress an emerging anomaly before any ripples of its existence can reach the wider world. Even here, we've only really scratched the surface of the SCP Foundation's extensive and frankly mind-boggling global and historical operations. There's plenty of information about the Foundation online, many of which people assume is pure fiction, but wouldn't that be the perfect cover for a real secret organization wanting to cover its tracks? As the quote says, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he doesn't exist. Ultimately, the SCP Foundation is on the side of mankind, but that doesn't mean it'll always act in our best interests. After all, if it means preserving the peace and getting another anomaly under wraps, the Foundation won't hesitate to terminate you and everyone you know without a second thought. Whether you'd want to face off against the Foundation itself or one of the anomalies they wish to contain is ultimately up to you, but trust us, neither would end well for you. Oh, speaking of which, there's another SCP we forgot to mention that's quite literally unspeakable. SCP-2521 is a creature that's made entirely of strange black tendrils that envelop and smother the creature's prey. No written records of the creature exist outside of pictograms because it immediately attacks and consumes any information produced about it. This includes speech, as the creature will appear and consume anyone who- Oh god. Oh no. It's- it's here. It's here, help me! Ah! The SCP Foundation is an organization dedicated to protecting humanity from the supernatural, whether it's dark gods, cursed objects, or killer creatures. But today, there's been a containment breach, and the fate of the entire world is at stake. To ensure you'll survive, you'll have to arm yourselves with knowledge. Thankfully, we've got you covered, with the lowdown on 10 of the scariest monsters that the Foundation has to offer. We'll start on what you might call the mild end of the spectrum, and end with pure unfiltered nightmare fuel. Beware and be ready, it's time to face your darkest fears. Number 10. SCP-169 – The Leviathan Thalassophobia, or fear of deep water, is one of the most common fears out there, which is why we're starting our countdown with SCP-169. SCP-169 is described as a massive marine arthropod, so large in size that no structure on Earth is capable of containing it. It measures between 2,000 and 8,000 kilometers in length. That's almost 5,000 miles. It's so large that it was originally thought to be an archipelago of islands. While its exact location is difficult to track, it's believed to be somewhere in the southern Atlantic off the coast of South America. This SCP is also unfathomably old having been around since at least the pre-Cambrian era. It's currently unknown if the creature is capable of reproduction and little is known about its feeding habits. According to researchers, it's likely that the creature is dormant, which is a terrifying prospect when you consider how much damage a creature of this enormous size could cause if it woke up. Even in its dormant state, it causes small earthquakes and tiny alterations in the Earth's rotation. So we wouldn't want to be around to find out what would happen if it started really swimming around. Worse still, since it's an arthropod, there's a chance that it would be able to breathe on land, though its size might prevent it from ever fully rising up from the depths. If you don't live near the coast, you can count yourself safe from SCP-169. However, this next one could appear anywhere, and what's worse, you could end up just like him if you aren't careful where you hang out. Number 9. SCP-3663 – The Adventure of the Cardboard Box 
SCP-3663 was once a boy, between the ages of 8 and 12, who while playing in some disused sewer tunnels with a friend made a cardboard monster costume for himself that he was then unable to remove. Over time, the costume fully fused with his body to the point that even his bones, muscles, and organs are now constructed entirely of fabric, tape, and other common craft materials. SCP-3663 teleports from place to place seemingly at random manifesting in any tunnels or tunnel-like structures and grabbing any nearby people, transporting them with him to the next location. When asked about the motives behind his actions, the SCP responded by saying, The tunnel monster captures people. That's me, I'm the tunnel monster. I capture people and I take them into tunnels where I live. It's what I do. I have to do it. He then began crying, finally saying, I don't want to play anymore. While this SCP doesn't cause any harm to his victims outside of a feeling of intense fear upon physical contact, the real horror comes from the fact that the SCP Foundation has yet to discover what caused the boy to become fused to his homemade costume or what led to his mental degradation, meaning that this horrible fate could potentially happen again to any unsuspecting child who decides to play in abandoned tunnels. If that isn't existentially terrifying enough for you, just wait, because the worst is yet to come. The next SCP causes changes that are even deadlier and more unbelievable, and it might be in your house right now. Number 8. I am SCP-426 and I am an ordinary toaster. Confused about why I'm talking about this SCP in the first person? Well, any humans attempting to describe this anomaly are unconsciously compelled to only refer to me in the first person. There seems to be no way to avoid doing this, and the more time humans spend around me, the compulsion to refer to me in the first person evolves into a genuine belief that they themselves are also toasters. Though this might sound ridiculous at first, the effect quickly takes a turn for the deadly. I was originally discovered by the Foundation when members of the family who first owned me were found dead in their home. The wife had died from electrocution after putting her tongue into an electrical socket in an attempt to plug herself into the wall, while her mother had swallowed so much bread that her stomach ruptured. According to the Foundation, the harmful effects start to manifest after about two months of continuously being in my presence, and I am functionally identical to any ordinary toaster that you might find in a store. So if you were thinking of buying a toaster, maybe it'd be wise to avoid it and just use the oven. But if you think I'm scary, just wait until you hear what's next. Number 7. SCP-072 – The Shadow Under the Bed If you've ever woken up in the middle of the night with your feet sticking over the edge of your bed, you'll be rightfully terrified of this next SCP. SCP-072 is a shadowy, translucent creature resembling an elongated human hand with sharpened fingertips. It attaches itself like a parasite to the shadows under beds, and multiple instances of 072 can occur in any beds within a 10-meter vicinity of the original. During the day, SCP-072 is inert, but once a human has laid on the bed, this SCP waits until the person is asleep and entering REM sleep. If the person's foot is hanging over the side of the bed, the SCP will begin tapping on the foot until the person awakes. Once awake, they'll be frozen in a state of sleep paralysis, helpless to do anything as the entity uses the tips of its fingers to slowly and meticulously slice off small pieces of flesh from their feet. People who have experienced this say they were fully aware of the pain that SCP-072 was causing them, despite the fact that they were unable to move. When an instance of SCP-072 is found in a building, the bed the entity is attached to must be destroyed as soon as possible, as well as all other beds in the radius of the infection. Instances of SCP-072 can be easily destroyed and detained, but when the SCP is a fixed location like our next SCP, that can be a little trickier and a lot deadlier. Number 6. SCP-354 – The Red Pool According to Foundation records, this next SCP was discovered by survivors of a plane crash somewhere in northern Canada. The SCP has since been closed off and is being constantly monitored by a dedicated team to ensure nobody and nothing gets in or out of the containment area. However, this SCP isn't dangerous in and of itself. It's what comes out of it that you have to worry about. SCP-354 is a pond full of deep red liquid that resembles, but is not, fresh blood. It has no banks, rather the liquid congeals around the edges and gradually becomes more solid until it completely blends with the soil around it. If the pond has a bottom, it's yet to be found. Periodically, hostile monstrous entities will emerge from the pond. Past instances have included a giant bat, a bear-sized animal with spines like an echidna, and a humanoid reptilian creature. And if that isn't bad enough, many people at the research site built to contain the pond believe that it's sentient and has been growing in size in response to the Foundation's containment efforts. As terrifying as the idea of a sentient lake full of monsters might be, all you have to do to avoid that one is stay out of northern Canada. 
This next SCP could be in the same town as you right now, and you wouldn't know until it was too late. Number 5. SCP-2086 The Living Bus Have you ever found yourself on the wrong bus? It can be a pretty stressful situation. But imagine if the bus you got on was not only going the wrong way, but actually luring you into its lair in order to feed you to its children. That's exactly what happens to the victims of SCP-2086, a species of giant insect that in their adult form are indistinguishable from an ordinary city bus. SCP-2086 nests in junkyards, building nests from old scrap metal for their children, who are much smaller and haven't yet developed their bus-like features. While SCP-2086 can fly using huge wings that fold up to form the roof of the bus, their usual mode of locomotion is rolling along city streets, picking up human passengers. Once the adult SCP-2086 has collected enough victims, it will release a noxious gas into its body cavity, knocking them out, at which point its young will drag the unconscious bodies out and consume them by sucking out their insides through hair-like filaments. If that's not gross enough for you, the drained husks of SCP-2086's victims are then fused to the inside of the creature's body and preserved with naturally occurring chemicals, serving as decoy bus drivers. But even this will still seem like a pleasant commute compared to the victims of our next horrible monster. Number 4. SCP-049 The Plague Doctor SCP-049 is a creature that resembles a medieval plague doctor, but instead of healing patients, this creature has been known to cause what could be described as a fate worse than death. SCP-049 is humanoid, and while it looks like someone in a plague doctor costume, tests have concluded that the cloak, hat, and mask are all part of the creature's body. It can communicate in multiple languages, and has stated its main goal is to rid the world of pestilence. Nobody is clear on what that means, but the SCP will get extremely agitated and aggressive if it encounters anyone it deems as infected with pestilence. Anyone this creature touches will die immediately, and autopsies have been inconclusive on the cause of death. If after killing a person SCP-049 decides that the pestilence hasn't been cured, it will conduct a surgery using a variety of strange tools. Once this surgery is complete, the patient will often rise from the dead as a mindless zombie. At this point, SCP-049 will deem them to be cured. Number 3. SCP-087 The Staircase Imagine the deepest, darkest basement you can think of. Now imagine it goes on forever. That's essentially the core of what SCP-087 is. This SCP is a staircase located somewhere on a university campus that is so dark and so deep that even a 75-watt bulb can only illuminate a couple of steps at a time. The staircase has no end, extending far below what both the layout of the building and the geography of the area around it should allow. When walking down the staircase, individuals will at some point begin hearing a child's voice, calling up to them from about 200 meters below. No matter how far they descend, however, the child's voice never gets any closer, and no child has ever been seen. What has been seen, however, is a disembodied white face with no pupils, mouth, or nostrils that appears behind people who try to descend the staircase. This face, known as SCP-087-1, is not the source of the child voices, but in some cases, it's been recorded chasing SCP Foundation D-Class personnel up and down the staircase. We don't know exactly what happens when the face catches you, but we're pretty sure we don't want to know. Almost no one who runs into SCP-087-1 has returned back to the top of the staircase, and those that did were left in terrible states that might even be worse than death. Number 2. SCP-1076 The Only Child Humans have a natural drive to care for their young, and that compassion is part of what has allowed us to thrive as a species. What makes SCP-1076 so scary is that it seems to be a creature specifically evolved to exploit that very instinct. SCP-1076 is a race of creatures that resemble disheveled, homeless human children between the ages of 3 and 6 dressed in rags and covered in dirt. These creatures are mute and initially only appear to parents who are walking alone. Once the adult spots the child, they'll be overcome with the desire to protect it and will immediately take it home. Once SCP-1076 has been taken in, the adult as well as any spouse or additional caregiver in the household will become obsessed with them to the point that their own biological children experience severe neglect. Even if child services are called, they will ignore the children as well and focus all their attention on SCP-1076. SCP-1076. As time goes on, the adults of the household will begin to neglect their own needs as well, 
meaning that an SCP-1076 encounter usually ends in the adult who took the creature in, dying from exhaustion, dehydration, or starvation. In cases where the adults are separated from SCP-1076, they become extremely violent in an attempt to get back to their baby. To make things even more disturbing, if two SCP-1076s are ever placed in close proximity to each other, they will viciously attack each other on sight, biting, scratching, and beating each other until one or both SCPs are dead. And now, after surviving this carousel of horrors, we have the most terrifying of all. Number 1. SCP-096 – The Shy Guy We'd love to show you a real picture of what SCP-096 looks like, but if we did, we'd essentially be sentencing you to death. Even seeing a part of this SCP's face can spell doom. SCP-096 is a hairless humanoid entity about 7 feet in height, who behaves in an animalistic manner and shows no sign of intelligence or sapience. While usually it's docile in temperament and content to either sit or pace in its containment cell, if anyone is unlucky enough to see its face, it will go on the warpath. The SCP becomes agitated, flying into a blind rage until it's tracked down and killed whoever caught a glimpse of it. No amount of distance can save you either. The effect still works through photo and video, and no matter where you are, SCP-096 has an innate sense of your location. When it's tracking someone down, nothing can stop it. Its top speed hasn't been recorded, and it's able to run through tanks and can even continue moving when its torso has been pulverized with bullet holes. The only thing that can stop SCP-096's rampage once it starts is for it to kill anyone and everyone who's looked at its face. See, we told you it was horrifying. The agents looked around themselves nervously. Everything was so familiar, yet so foreign. The grass was dead, there wasn't a single sound to be heard, and not even a fly buzzing around in the air. All signs of life had disappeared. They dreaded to think about what they'd find when they examined this world further, but they knew they were here for answers. They continued on. As they walked around, it didn't take long to notice the corpses everywhere, lying on the dead yellow grass, sprawled across park benches, yet none of the bodies were rotting. It was as if they'd just died a few minutes ago. Nervously, they walked into a nearby house. There, the corpses of an entire family were sat on chairs around their dinner table with plates in front of them like they died unexpectedly in the middle of a meal. It was the end of the world, but why and how? SCPs come in all shapes and sizes and mean different things for the world. Some want to kill, others want to be left in peace, others can coexist with the human race, but there are a few SCPs that could blow all the other SCPs out of the water by ending the world completely. Whether a ZK scenario that changes nature and natural order, a CK scenario that fundamentally alters reality as we know it, or an XK scenario that destroys the universe and humanity, there are some serious threats out there and there's little anyone can do to stop them. Everyone fears the big and scary creatures from the SCP world, but some of the most threatening SCPs look innocent enough at first. SCP-498 is literally an alarm clock, but there's a catch. The alarm is capable of killing humans and perhaps even destroying the planet. Here's how it works. Every 11 minutes, the alarm clock goes off at a sound of 30 decibels. That's the sound level of a quiet rural area. It's so quiet, most people could probably sleep through it but every 10 seconds the sound increases by 4 decibels. That might not sound like much, but if the alarm is allowed to continue, there's no limit to the devastation it could have. A sound of 150 decibels can burst the eardrums of humans. A sound of 200 decibels is enough to kill a person. Meanwhile, a sound as loud as 1100 decibels could destroy the world, because it would create so much energy that it could create a black hole larger than the universe. With an increase of 4 decibels every 10 seconds, it would take only a few minutes to reach that point. The Foundation has attempted to destroy 498 to bring its danger to the world to an end, but so far the attempts haven't been successful. Instead, the only remaining solution is to ensure the snooze button is hit every 11 minutes until the end of time. It doesn't leave much room for error, and things haven't always gone to plan. The Foundation used to rely on a mechanical arm to automatically hit the snooze button, but one day the arm malfunctioned. Foundation personnel needed to step in and hit the button themselves until a new mechanical arm could be made. It sounds simple, but it wasn't. Unfortunately, there are some not-so-nice side effects of being around 498, such as increased alertness. 
One of the agents charged with guarding 498 became angry and aggressive and started arguing with the other agent in the room who was trying to reset the clock. As they argued, 498 still hadn't been reset and was beginning to make more noise. Whenever the sane agent tried to move and reset the device, the rogue agent would hit him to keep him away. After two minutes passed, the noise level became so high that the personnel were in pain and the camera filming the whole thing began to vibrate from the acoustic stress. Still, the rogue foundation member didn't want to let anyone near the alarm clock to put this all to an end. Eventually, another officer came in and managed to shoot the rogue agent and activate the emergency switch to alert the foundation, but at this point, his eardrums had ruptured and he was about to collapse. He failed to turn off the alarm. A while later, a containment team arrived to find the original good agent lying beside 498 with blood pouring out of his ears in a robotic state. He was lying barely conscious on the floor but repeatedly pressing the reset button. At some point, he'd managed to turn off 498 before it could do further damage and destroy the world. Both the officer and the agent survived the incident, but much stricter procedures were put into place for the future. After all, the world could have ended that day. So far, the SCP Foundation has successfully protected the universe by locking away 498 in a secure containment and implementing the strictest procedure. It's currently in a soundproof bunker that can cancel 95% of sound waves, but if for any reason the alarm clock can't be reset or the Foundation staff went rogue again, it would destroy the universe. Most SCPs can be contained or guarded to minimize their impact, like 498, but a few are so large that even the Foundation can't do much to hold them back. SCP-3000 is a prime example. The Foundation first discovered 3000 after strange reports from fishermen around the Indian Ocean. One day, a submarine went down to investigate with personnel on board, and they couldn't believe what they found. Deep underwater, they found an enormous eel-like creature. It must have been hundreds of kilometers long, and its head alone was unbelievably large. But the scariest part of all was its eyes, illuminating the darkness. There was also a strange gray liquid surrounding 3000. The closer the submarine got to 3000, the stranger they began to feel. The doctor on board started sweating, exhibiting anxious behaviors and whimpering. Nobody could make much sense out of what the man was saying, but he repeatedly talked about seeing darkness and nothingness. As the submarine reached the eel, the doctor became totally insane, smashing his head against the submarine window until the glass smashed. The mission had to quickly return back up to the surface, but the doctor died. Nobody was sure what had happened, but it was suspected 3000 has an impact on the cognition of humans. On a later mission, three divers went down to find out more about 3000. Tragically, 3000 swallowed two of the divers and emitted more of the gray liquid. Fortunately, one of the divers managed to send a sample of the strange liquid up to the surface before also dying. It turned out that the stuff was a powerful amnestic called Y909 that causes confusion, panic, and memory alteration. The SCP Foundation have used Y909 ever since to help with other missions, but it's not the kind of substance that you want to get into the wrong hands. Nobody likes the idea of a ginormous creature that makes them go insane and will possibly eat them, but it gets worse. Although the Foundation are still uncertain of many of the details regarding 3000, some theorize that the creature could actually be asleep, explaining why it never moves from its position in the Indian Ocean. But if 3000 were to wake up one day and harness its true potential, the world would really be in trouble. A 3,000 kilometer eel unleashing its wrath on communities around the globe and emitting Y909 everywhere. That would definitely be an end of the world scenario. Others think 3000, also known as Ananta Shisha, could be a god. Maybe Judgment Day will arrive sometime soon. Ready to hear something even weirder? Enter in SCP-3805, which may one day lead to an XK scenario that destroys the universe. 3805 is a huge embryonic entity lying deep below the Earth. In fact, what we used to believe were natural geological layers of the Earth seem to be 3805 itself. The outer crust of the Earth is actually the shell of 3805, and the outer core below is a series of tunnels made of gelatin-like substances. The inner core is the embryo. It points to the conclusion that the Earth seems to be some kind of egg, bearing a creature beneath the surface. 3805 bears an embryo and seems to be in a state of gestation. It all begs a simple question, what will happen when it fully develops? Nobody knows, but it's unlikely to be good news. Whatever 3805 is, the Foundation knows it's sturdy and not easily destroyed. All kinds of drilling, excavation, or digging activities don't impact it. However, in some places, interfering with or provoking 3805 seems to make it spawn. In past expeditions or experiments, when personnel have drilled into 3805, it causes dark purple dust clouds filled with stars to form. As soon as the external stimulation that created the spawning stops, these dust clouds also stop, so they might be some kind of defense 
defensive mechanism. Currently, there are two spawns of 3805 above the ground that nobody has managed to disperse. They form their own passageways and offer entry into 3805. A few brave personnel have attempted to take expeditions to seal the tunnels to 3805, and others have accidentally stumbled across it in oil drilling or similar operations. They reported seeing dark liquid, tentacles, and the joints of a creature. While some escaped alive, others were less lucky. It seems that 3805 absorbed them. Unfortunately, it's difficult to collect much information about 3805 because of its location. The high temperatures that deep into the core of the Earth make it difficult to actually get anywhere near it. But ultimately, it seems like humanity is at the mercy of this insentient, sprawling being below the ground. It's just a waiting game until one day 3805 hatches or breaks out of the ground and takes the world for itself. Perhaps it will absorb everything and everyone on the surface. Worryingly, oil drilling operations appear to have awakened the beast already, and the spawn now on the surface of the Earth puts human life in grave danger. Also lying below the ground is SCP-2935, and this SCP is even crazier than 3805 because it's not just threatening to hatch out and destroy the world, it promises to alter time and reality too, causing a CK event. From the outside, 2935 looks just like a regular cave, but instead of leading to some damp, dark grotto, it contains the passageway to an alternate reality. 2935 leads to an exact replica of the world we know, except for one key difference. There's no life there. It's not just human life that's absent, but also animals, plants, and sentient entities like machines and computers. After noticing strange radio signals coming from the cave in Indiana, the SCP Foundation sent a drone down to the cave to investigate. They could never have predicted what they'd find. There were corpses lying all over the ground of animals and humans alike. It seemed that they died spontaneously and instantly, because the corpses were dotted around as if the people had been going about their daily activities when they died. Mysteriously, there was a message being broadcast from the SCP Foundation in the alternate reality saying that there had been a containment breach and communication breakdown urging everyone to stay in their home. The Foundation sent teams to find out more and collect samples. They arrived to find the area almost exactly the same as the world on the other side of the cave, but with all life gone. Even the most dangerous SCPs from the Foundation had died. The samples they took revealed some surprising facts. Each organism had suffered 100% cell death, explaining why the corpses weren't rotting. Judging by the date on a newspaper found there, this had happened on the 20th of April 2016, or a few days before the team arrived. But what, or who, had killed everyone? On a later mission, even stranger things started happening. One of the personnel, Agent Keller, was exploring a Foundation site in the alternate reality when he sent out an ominous message to the rest of the team. He told them to seal the cave and detonated the building where he was, killing himself and the rest of his men. Incidentally, Keller's corpse from the alternate dimension was the only one decomposing. This is where things get complicated. It turned out that Keller had found an encrypted message written by an alternate dimension Keller who had set out on a mission to a different alternate dimension after detecting strange radio signals from the cave. But when this alternate dimension Keller returned, he found every living thing in his own dimension dead. He then killed himself. The Keller from this dimension opted to kill himself when he found out, worrying that if he returned to his own dimension it would result in the death of every living creature there too. The Foundation promptly sealed the cave. Although there's lots of uncertainty over how the people in the alternate world died, the Foundation suspects some creature is using radio signals to lure Foundation members down caves. If it succeeds, it could spell death and destruction in an infinite number of realities and dimensions. So you had a job interview with the SCP Foundation, nailed it, signed the requisite non-disclosure agreement, and you got yourself the job. Congrats! Now you're an operative in charge of some of the strangest, scariest, and most dangerous discoveries out there, and it's time to secure, contain, and protect. So what is your assignment here at the good old SCP Foundation? You must have drawn the short straw because you have to keep an eye on one of the deadliest creatures in the organization's custody, SCP-096, also known as the Shy Guy. As your terrible luck would have it, on your first day looking after it, SCP-096 has escaped from custody, and you're now in very real danger of a direct encounter. It's now up to you to face off against this formidable foe and try to make it out in one piece. But don't despair just yet. We're here with all the advice you need to survive your first day on the job and best SCP-096 as lethal as it may be. So strap in and get ready for the fight of your life. Before we can talk about how a fight against this anomalous creature might go for you, it's important to know your enemy as well as you can. So let's get to know SCP-096. It may be nicknamed the Shy Guy, but trust us when we say it is nowhere near as demure as that sounds. In fact, 096 may be one of the most frightening finds in the history of the organization, and it's not to be underestimated. 
an emaciated-looking humanoid creature, Shy Guy stands about 2.38 meters tall. It is pale and hairless, with unnaturally long arms that span a length of 1.5 meters each, perfect for strangling, beating, and dismembering foes from a distance. If that wasn't terrifying enough, its jaw can open four times wider than the average human. You read that correctly. This thing can open its jaw four times wider than a human jaw. Its eyes have no pigmentation, and it may or may not be able to see. Whether it has a sense of sight or not, SCP-096 can tell when it's being observed. Normally, when left alone, it spends its time pacing and largely keeping to itself. However, once its face has been seen, whether in person, via a video feed, or in a photograph, SCP-096 stops being quite so docile. This is where the dangerous part comes in. Once its face has been spotted, SCP-096 flies into hysterics, screaming, babbling, and covering its face in apparent despair. Don't feel too guilty for upsetting it, however, because that's time you should be using to run. The next thing the creature will do, once it's got its weeping out of its system, is begin heading right for you. SCP-096 runs at a documented speed of at least 35 kilometers per hour, so good luck trying to outrun it once it sets its sights on you. Once it reaches you, it will kill you. Details of the method of killing have been redacted from official SCP reports, but whatever it does, it leaves no trace of its victim behind. So you're very possibly going to get really familiar with that freakishly large mouth. When SCP-096 was initially captured, it was found outdoors in extreme cold without a scrap of clothing on it. The creature was just calmly sitting there, without giving off so much as a shiver in response to the temperature. Multiple members of the team assigned to retrieve it happened to see its face, and that's when the mission took a turn for the worse. The entity began to scream and cry, sounding more like a person than an animal, to a reportedly uncanny degree. The team fired on the entity, but the bullets didn't do so much as phase it. It picked up one member of the team and ripped off his leg. The team fired an anti-tank round at the entity and again, it didn't so much as slow it down or take any noticeable structural damage. The entity only calmed when everyone who had seen its face was destroyed, after which it sat back down. A soldier who had not yet seen the creature's face placed a bag over its head, seemingly preventing any future deadly outbursts. So now let's get back to your predicament. You're working at the SCP Foundation, going about your merry business when suddenly you find yourself about to be face to face with an escaped SCP-096. Face being the operative word. The first tip for surviving an encounter with SCP-096 is to avoid looking at its face. Of course, but when that option is out the window, what can you do to escape with your life? Is it possible to defeat the creature that wasn't even slowed down by an anti-tank weapon and a team of armed operatives? Maybe. It may be tempting to try and take a flamethrower to the gangling creep or just turn tail and run away from it, but as we know by now, neither of these solutions are likely to be viable. However, there is hope, and maybe your first day at the new job does not have to be your last. There are a few possible solutions that would allow you to come out victorious in a conflict with SCP-096, and they have less to do with pure firepower and more to do with utilizing the most powerful weapon in the human arsenal, your mind. Option 1. Cover the entity's face. As previously mentioned, the entity's aggressive behavior was curtailed when a bag was placed over its head during its capture. Covering SCP-096's face seems to render it passive, even helpless. However, this is a risky option, as it would require you to get close enough to the entity to put a covering over its face, and it's likely that getting that close would result in you accidentally seeing said face. Once that happens, it may be too late to get the bag over its head before the entity flies into a rage and tears you limb from limb like a helpless crustacean at your local crab shack. You could always try to close your eyes and approach the entity with the bag in the world's most dangerous game of pin the tail on the donkey, but we don't recommend it. Option 2 is high risk, but with a potentially high reward. While SCP-096 does not respond to assaults with deadly weapons, there is one thing that it is afraid of, and that has done significant damage to it in the past. This is yet another highly dangerous entity, SCP-682, one of the most powerful, deadly, and aggressive anomalies the Foundation has ever been able to contain. This entity is not to be trifled with, but if you can get it into the room with SCP-096 and get yourself as far away from the both of them as possible, it may just solve your problem. The two creatures were previously introduced to each other in an attempt to terminate SCP-096, and while 096 survived the encounter, it emerged from the attempt severely wounded and upset. 
Future exposure to SCP-682 caused SCP-096 to erupt into hysterics, screaming and clawing at its own face. If you need to get SCP-096's attention away from you and perhaps succeed in terminating it, it is definitely worth a shot. So what is SCP-682? Simply put, it's a highly dangerous and difficult to destroy reptilian creature. It exhibits a high level of intelligence. Unlike SCP-096, which does not appear to be especially intelligent or aware of its surroundings beyond its fits of rage that follow its face being seen, this entity hates all life forms and is incredibly strong, fast, and exhibits lightning quick reflexes. Its size fluctuates dramatically and quickly depending on what it's ingested. It's capable of speech and has given several interviews where it admits its hatred for life and its willingness to kill. It is regarded as extremely dangerous and it's seemingly impossible to permanently kill. We say permanently because the creature has been temporarily killed in the past, but it was able to resurrect itself afterwards. It recovered from bullets, acid, fire, and attacks from other SCPs. It has successfully escaped six times and attempted escape unsuccessfully 17 additional times. So is it worth it to attempt to employ SCP-682 as a weapon against 096? That is debatable, but the answer is likely no. At the very least, it's a dangerous last resort that would possibly cost you your life even if it is able to turn terminate 096. For starters, SCP-682 would have to be released from its containment, a room full of acid that consistently erodes away its skin so that it can attack 096 in the first place. As previously mentioned, 682 is highly intelligent and is unlikely to be able to be tricked or manipulated into acting on your behalf unknowingly. If it goes after SCP-096 and attacks the humanoid monstrosity, it will do so only because it wants to. Because this creature hates all living things and you just happen to be living, it's just as likely that it'll attack and kill you before it goes after SCP-096. However, if by some miracle you were able to get SCP-682 and the shy guy into the same room without getting killed in the process, then you may have just freed yourself from this dangerous trap. Once 682 sees 96, it'll attempt to kill it, as it has in previous encounters. Meanwhile, 96 will be thrown into a state of distress at the sight of 682, distracting the shy guy from your presence and allowing you to escape and find a superior who can amend the situation and return both creatures to their containment. This would require a great deal of planning, however, and no small amount of good luck. Since you found yourself in this situation in the first place, luck does not appear to be on your side. This brings us to our third and final option, and it's the one that's most likely to prove effective against SCP-096, allowing you to terminate the creature and emerge victorious. As you already know, the shy guy cannot bear for anyone to see its face, and will viciously attack anyone that does so. Much like in the myth of Perseus and Medusa, it all comes down to reflections. In the story of Medusa, the hero Perseus was able to avoid being turned into stone by looking at Medusa's reflection in his shield, rather than looking at her directly. Since SCP-096 attacks anyone who sees its face, not just directly but via indirect methods like video and photographs, it's unlikely that looking at its reflection would save you. However, we aren't just trying to save you, we're trying to defeat SCP-096. The solution is as simple as it is effective. Take a reflective surface, ideally a mirror or a piece of reflective metal if you can find one in the facility, and approach SCP-096 with it. Keep your eyes averted from its face, looking down at the rest of its body or just at its feet on the floor. Just make sure that you can see which way it's facing. Then present the creature with the mirror, showing it its own reflection. If what we know about the entity holds true, it will fly into its trademark uncontrollable violent rage and begin to attack the creature that has seen its face. In this scenario, that creature is itself. It'll begin to tear itself to pieces, ripping and clawing until there's nothing left of itself or until it cannot move anymore. Because SCP-096 seems to be stronger than any weapons we have, the only weapon that makes sense to kill it with is itself. Once it's stopped its self-destructive assault and has been neutralized, you will be able to escape with your life and the knowledge that this deadly threat has been eliminated once and for all. Congratulations! Not only did you live through your first day at the SCP Foundation, but you succeeded where countless other scientists have failed and managed to terminate one of the organization's deadliest finds. Okay, okay, it won't be that easy. If showing the thing its reflection was the simplest way to totally kill it, the Foundation would have done it already. But according to some accounts, being presented with reflective surfaces has caused the creature to frantically claw at its own face in a state of extreme distress. What could be a better distraction to tag and bag this insecure monster and cart it back to its cell? Either way, your work here is done. Run yourself a hot bath, pour yourself a drink, and celebrate a job well done. Now let's see what kind of trouble you can run into tomorrow. What a year 2020's been so far!
The year started out great, a new decade, a new you, and then quickly spiraled out of control with you ending up in a fight versus Baby Yoda, the Mandalorian, the Joker, you name it, and you've been in a battle royale for your life ever since this crappy year started. Not to mention the time you took a job as a combine transhuman civil protection officer and you had your memories wiped so you could forget all about your past horrors, only to have Gordon freaking Freeman reappear after 20 years and ruin your day all over again. Well, that's it. You've had it. You're officially retiring from the world and buying a nice, quaint suburban home somewhere where the biggest threat you'll have to worry about is your neighbor Joe growing greener grass than yours. Your first night into suburbia bliss though, and you wake up with the strong urge to check the window. Confused, you groggily walk over to the window and peer outside, only to feel your blood run cold. Standing there in a sort of half crouch is a person. No, it's, it's a thing of some kind that looks vaguely like a person. This monster is tall, skinny, and has two deeply set eyes that are boring straight into your soul. Seriously, you just can't catch a break. When did you officially take over Bruce Campbell's job and become humanity's last line of defense against evil, the wicked, and the, well, just plain weird? You resign yourself to your fate as you reach for the nearest baseball bat because you may not have a chainsaw hand, but you're officially in a fight to the death against the legendary internet monster, the Rake. The Rake is a recently rediscovered monster with origins in the 12th century, when it was first reported. The creature appeared to be extremely rare, however, and there may have been accounts pre-12th century, but the 1100s is simply the earliest documented accounts of the creature that have survived to this day. What exactly the creature is, though, remains a matter of discussion. Accounts on the creature's behavior range from the benign to the outright hostile, with some witnesses reporting that the creature simply observed them for long periods of time, and others saying that they or someone they know was physically attacked attacked by it. Its motives are impossible to determine, and its transitions from peaceful observation to violent outbursts are so alien that some have theorized that the rake may indeed be an extraterrestrial creature. It's not even known if the entity is a single creature with an incredibly long lifespan or multiple creatures that have survived for centuries. Where it originated is also unknown, as the earliest reports come from Europe, yet one account from a sailor in 1681 during the exploration of the New World seems to indicate that the creature threatened him to return with his crew to England and never return. While motives and even the nature of the creature are still unknown, there are two common behaviors of the rake widely reported in eyewitness accounts. The first is its propensity to visit sleeping individuals who are awakened when they become aware of its presence. Nearly every time the creature is discovered sitting or crouching silently at the foot of the bed, and oddly enough, some witnesses claim to feel terror upon discovering it, while others feel curiosity or even a sense of compassion. Upon realizing that the witness is awake, the rake will approach and typically touch the individual, sometimes causing an almost psychotic fear response that lingers long after the creature has left. Some investigators claim that the government is aware of the creature's origins or intentions and is actively working to frustrate the efforts of research into the rake. After an outbreak of sightings in 2003, the story, which was widely reported in the media at the time, mysteriously disappeared from all media. The information blackout even stretched into electronic sources and eyewitness accounts, which were systematically purged from websites across the internet. While the who behind the cover-up isn't known, what's clear is that only the US government or perhaps an alien entity could have the resources to undertake such a massive purge of information. The rake continues to be seen to this day, even occasionally being caught on infrared camera traps used by hunters. The creature stands out at around 6 feet tall, though seems to prefer to move on all fours and rarely ever stands unless threatened. It has two deeply set eyes and a small mouth which unhinges to become much larger, displaying rows of large but dulled teeth. Its long fingers end in sharp claws which has often been used to attack witnesses who attempt to provoke or approach the creature. While the rake is physically tall, it's not particularly imposing though, as it appears to be very thin and scrawny, likely weighing in at around 150 pounds. Other than a viciously savage disposition when provoked or when randomly attacking individuals, the rake is not known to be particularly strong or fast, simply using the victim's own surprise and terror to overwhelm them. Attacks are not known to be fatal, though they can cause extreme injuries thanks to the creature's small but sharp claws. So the rake is haunting your peaceful suburban slice of life. How are you going to fight and defeat this creepy monster of the night? First, you want to avoid getting bad touched by the rake because it appears as if the creature has the ability to impart extremely negative emotions through touch. It's possible the rake has some low-level psychic power that requires physical touch, but can leave you filled with a crippling terror that can take weeks or even years to overcome. Given the creature's lack of physical strength, 
Perhaps it developed this ability as a defense mechanism. To avoid the rake's bad touch, take the advice given to many altar boys and get yourself a neoprene diving suit to wear under your clothes. The skin-tight diving suit can be extremely difficult to remove without your consent, and the half-inch thick layer of material is meant to insulate your body from freezing ocean temperatures, perfect for blocking the bad touch powers of the rake or a renegade Catholic priest. With a hood, this leaves only your face exposed to potential bad touches, though if you're really concerned, you can pick yourself up a hockey mask and protect your moneymaker. The rake's primary weapon seems to be its small but sharp claws, which your diving suit won't protect from. Take a tip from the wildlife photographers and videographers and buy yourself a steel mesh shark suit, meant to be worn over your diving suit. That steel mesh suit has been worn by nature documentary makers all over the world and can protect from shark attacks up to a shark as big as a bull shark, making it perfect for things like getting right in the middle of a school of hunting white reef sharks. You've protected yourself physically from the rake, but there's one more ability to be aware of. Further evidence of the rake's low-level psychic abilities comes from its ability to project a soothing or non-threatening aura to some witnesses, despite its monstrous appearance. You don't want to take any chances and have this thing lull you into a sense of complacency so it can bad touch you all over the place. So you need to get into the right frame of mind. You need to get into and stay in a fighting mood. And for that, there's literally nothing better than some good old rage against the machine. Back in the heyday of the 90s, rage tried to warn us about the lack of affordable housing, exploitation of workers by corporations, and the widening divide between the 2% wealthy elite and the rest of us. Today, well, let's just say that their music was nothing if not prophetic. So channel your inner anger at being denied a living wage while having your rent increased every year or the fact that no matter how hard you work, you'll literally never afford a home and spend most of your life repaying student loans which accrue interest. It's time to get angry and stay that way. It's time to rage against the rake. But how do you defeat the rake? Well, to be honest, it's not particularly difficult. The creature may be creepy and have some low-level psychic abilities, but it's not super fast or super strong. Most witnesses are too shocked by its terrifying appearance to react, but you are a modern-day Bruce Campbell. You've faced hordes of witches, <laughs> aliens, and demons already. This scrawny nerd is a piece of cake for you. So pick up that baseball bat and head on down to Pound Town, <laughs> because this internet meme is getting squashed for good. Just avoid that bad touch. Hey, we know what you're thinking. How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? But don't worry, you spoke, we listened, and now we're going to take another crack at this. The SCP Foundation harbors some of the most terrifying creatures and entities humanity has ever known, from plague doctors that can kill with a touch, to murderous old men who can walk through walls, to cataclysmic multi-dimensional nightmare gods. If an average civilian came into contact with one of the Foundation's more aggressive entities, they're probably doomed. So let's even the odds. You're a member of one of the Foundation's mobile task forces, the highly trained special ops groups employed by the Foundation to retrieve or subdue dangerous anomalies. You have almost unlimited resources, advanced knowledge of your enemies, and technology not available to standard militaries. If anyone can get these beasts under control, it's you. And today you have your job cut out for you. There's been a deadly containment breach, and three of the Foundation's more well-known abominations are on the loose. SCP-173, the deadly living statue, SCP-096, the mass murdering shy guy, and SCP-682, an immortal, highly intelligent lizard with a serious attitude problem. Seeing as you're not working for Site-13's director Emerson or the Global Occult Coalition, the objective isn't to kill these monsters, and let's be honest, you probably couldn't if you tried. If we can get this terrible trio back into containment with minimal casualties and without getting killed or eaten in the process, we can call this a win. Let's see what these entities are made of and how we might be able to get them back into containment by any means necessary. First up, SCP-173, also known as the Sculpture, the Killer Statue, and by some, the Peanut. This is one you'll want to keep an eye on. Seriously, if you take your eyes off this creature for so much as a second, even to blink, it'll zoom at you with incredible speed and snap your neck like an Olive Garden breadstick. Despite being one of the more well-known monsters from the SCP Foundation catalog, the creature commands an impressive sense of mystery. According to tests, the creature's body is made entirely of concrete, rebar, and the Krylon brand spray paint that gives its distinctive markings. It appears to have no nervous or vascular systems, rendering dangerous nerve agents useless against it. And we still don't know what gives this creature its anomalous properties. The creature does somehow emit blood and waste products in spite of this, but you'll learn that things often don't make sense when you're dealing with anomalies. The Foundation, however, has worked out a means for keeping this creature contained relatively safely. Personnel are even 
been able to enter the cell to clean, provided they go in there three at a time to maintain a constant visual on the creature. But in the event of a containment breach, all bets are off. When those alarm bells are ringing, and you're hearing the gruesome telltale crunches of necks snapping all around you, it's easy for panic to set in. This creature has incredible speed, seemingly unlimited aggression, and more physical strength than any human being. So how do you get it back into containment? Perhaps you can gang up on the beast with two other members of your mobile task force and take blink shifts to make sure it doesn't get loose and tear you a new one. You could, but that's an extremely risky option. You may be highly disciplined soldiers, but in a high pressure situation everyone makes mistakes, and making a mistake around SCP P-173 can cost you and your entire team the integrity of your spines. So what's a completely safe method of maintaining constant visual contact with the sculpture while you're returning it to its containment cell? Thankfully the answer is right under your nose, in Site-19, where the sculpture has been kept since 1993. Meet SCP-131, also known as the iPods. These are two friendly safe class anomalies that appear to be small biomechanical creatures with a single perpetually unblinking eye at the center of their bodies. They're harmless and benevolent beings who have a natural tendency toward helping and protecting humans, and in this instance they're the key to getting 173 back under control. If you recruit the help of these friendly little creatures, they'll keep an eye on SCP-173, keeping it frozen in its own body as you lift it up and haul it to the containment. And hey, presto, that's one SCP back under lock and key, two to go. But uh, don't get too comfortable because now you're going toe to toe with SCP-096, aka the Shy Guy. While this creature is a Euclid class just like 173, when it's out of containment, it's an order of magnitude more dangerous than its concrete predecessor. While this huge, gangling, white creature might be docile when not in its rage state, if someone so much as glimpses the creature's face, even a single pixel of a photo, though not artistic depictions, this thing becomes an unstoppable destruction machine. It'll turn tanks and military helicopters into lumps of inert metal. It'll run through solid walls like they're wet tissue paper. Think you can take this creature down with 50 caliber sniper bullets and anti-tank missiles? We regret to inform you that it can take that licking and keep on ticking. Even with the majority of its body mass destroyed, the creature keeps going, and its skeletal structure appears to be totally indestructible. It can travel at frightening speeds with unlimited stamina and has killed 100% of human targets that have seen its face. Its ferocity is so great that it doesn't leave a single trace of any of its victims. Seeing as it was discovered butt naked in sub-zero temperatures and appears just as effective in combat deep underwater as it does on land, there's really no battleground where you have the advantage. If the reason this monster breached containment is that you saw its face, well, other than praying you might be out of luck. But if the creature breached containment because some other poor sucker saw its face, then at least you're in there with a fighting chance of getting the creature back into containment. First, you should never attempt to stop the creature while it's still in hot pursuit of whoever saw its face. You simply will not stop it in that state, and nothing really has. You must approach the creature while it's in its docile post-kill state, and take extreme caution to avoid seeing its face in the process. The Foundation has explored methods of augmenting vision in order to block out the face in the past, <laughs> such as Dr. Dan's scramble technology, but this has often resulted in grim and deadly failure that left good task force members dead. Your objective will be to quite literally bag the creature by pulling a bag over its head. The creature will not attempt to remove the bag at least for a while as it displays no real intelligence outside of its single-minded pursuit of prey. Once it's bagged, the monster can be easily captured and taken back to containment, where it will endlessly pace around its cell under constant audio-only surveillance from Foundation personnel. But here's the question, how do you get so close to the thing without looking at it? Thankfully, you have valuable knowledge gleaned from a certain classic party game, Pin the Tail on the Donkey. The creature will only go into attack mode if its face is seen or if you attack it first. So after locating the creature, your best course of action is to blindfold yourself and approach with the bag. It's a daunting task, but if you can establish enough physical contact to estimate the position of the head, then bag it, you've just saved a lot of lives and have ultimate bragging rights that you beat a classic party game on hard mode. SCP-096 is now safely on the way back to the Foundation, where Dr. Dan can continue his tireless research into its neutralization. Two down, one to go, and boy have we saved the hardest for last. Meet SCP-682, also known as the hard to kill reptile. And believe us when we say this thing has earned that nickname, this creature has faced off against SCP-173 multiple times and survived every encounter. It also engaged in a 
brutal 27-hour battle with SCP-096 in the past, and not only survived, but reduced the Shy Guy to a gibbering, incoherent mess. Unlike its two predecessors, 682 is not a mindless monster, but is actually an extremely intelligent predator capable of advanced forethought and even setting deadly traps, such as creating a helium shell around its body to protect from attack, and shattering the shell into deadly shards to shred Foundation personnel when they approached. There's even some merit to the theory that SCP-682 is one of the seven children of the legendary and terrifying Scarlet King, thought by the Foundation to be the greatest living threat to the multiverse. SCP-682 may not be the deadliest SCP out there, considering that there are some who are more capable of triggering the apocalypse, but it's rightly one of the most feared. The monster's reputation comes from three main factors, durability, adaptability, and malice. And you'll need to understand all three of these if you want any hope of getting the hard-to-kill reptile back into containment. Durability. The Foundation have tried every conceivable method of killing this thing, from total incineration to high-powered acid to cross-testing with other deadly anomalies. And the only time 682 has been successfully killed is in the alternate universe contained within SCP-2935. However, no battle is worth risking the involvement of SCP-2935, as it could result in the spontaneous destruction of all life in our dimension. Next, adaptability. 682 has shown that it's capable of learning, adapting to, and weaponizing anything used against it. Even the calming, joy-inducing effects of SCP-999 were transformed into a crippling laughter blast that allowed 682 to break containment. And finally, malice. 682 despises all life of any kind and has the stated intention of killing anything and everything it can. While it may be intelligent, there's no reasoning with this creature. It wants you and your team dead, and it will do anything to make that happen. Seeing as there's no hope of killing this thing, how can you potentially incapacitate it and get it back into its acid-filled containment chamber before it recovers? Well, for this, we need to turn back to the classic adage, there's safety in numbers. According to SCP-682's official documentation, in case of containment breach, SCP-682 is to be tracked and recaptured by all available mobile task forces, and no teams with fewer than seven members are cleared to engage it. In other words, your best bet is calling in all the heavily armed reinforcements you can and taking on the creature with a mix of advanced military tactics and conventional arms fire. While the classic monster movie temptation of busting out the nukes and napalm may be alluring, the risk of the creature adapting to those attacks and introducing them into his own arsenal is too great. There are some SCPs who have been known to have a pacifying effect on 682 and may therefore be useful in your recapture mission. Perhaps the best example is SCP-053, a small child who causes murderous tendencies in those who spend more than 10 minutes in her presence. While bringing her along definitely puts a time limit on the mission, 53 has an unparalleled ability to make 682 become docile without giving it any new powers in the process. She may be able to prevent 682 from causing further damage while your team mobilizes around the creature. With her help, it may be possible for you and your small arm army of mobile task force members to get SCP-682 tagged, bagged, and hauled back to the base for containment. So there you have it, the tried and true methods for getting these deadly creatures and entities back under Foundation control. If you spend enough time on the internet, it's just a fact of life that you'll see something you really wish you hadn't. Maybe it's perennial shock site classics like Two Girls One Cup, or some of the truly horrific photos and footage of real life death and murder floating around on the web. But what if we told you there was something even worse out there? An image that just by looking at it, you might be driven to pain, madness, or even death. That's exactly what we're here to discuss today. The terrifying internet legend of Smile Dog, the photo with the power to kill. Smile Dog is the colloquial name for a seemingly innocent image file called smile.jpg that's been floating around the internet since as early as 1992. According to most sources, because of the image's place in internet folklore, there are thousands of copycats out there, none that have the sinister and deadly power of the original. From the scattered reports of the image's victims, we do have a vague description. It's a scan of a Polaroid photo featuring a dog that appears to be a Siberian Husky against a dark background. The dog has a wide, almost human grin with teeth that look like they simply don't belong in the creature's face. Worse yet, in the darkened corner to the left of the dog is a red hand, outstretched toward the viewer. Many of the people who've actually seen the image have described the hand as beckoning, as though it's calling them into the darkness of the photo. Some viewers have even speculated that this is the hand of the devil himself, calling them down to the depths of hell. Naturally, as an intellectually curious viewer of the infographic show, you'll want to search for the cursed image. And don't worry, we're going to show it to you. That's right, the real, original smile.jpg. 
But before we subject you to that, you have to understand what you're getting yourself into here. After all, if the legends are true, it might just change your life. While the stories about Smile.jpg have circulated the internet since the internet was a publicly available commodity, the first true, solid, and widely available account of a person's experience with Smile.jpg and SmileDog appeared on 4chan's Paranormal Board in 2008. The Paranormal Board is the birthplace of a number of terrifying internet urban legends and creepypastas, such as the malicious shape-shifting Goatman the deadly Daruma-san bath ritual, and an infamous porcelain doll with living, wriggling innards. A frightening tale like that of Smile Dog would be right at home on this hub of the strange and paranormal, but the story's haunting details still stick with everyone unlucky enough to read them. It began with someone who was just curious, not unlike you. They were a young, aspiring writer in college, searching for interesting stories that might inspire some exciting new fiction. But they stumbled on a horror that was all too real. They put out the call for people with interesting stories on the internet and got plenty of duds. You know, all the stories about that time someone's weird uncle caught a big one while out fishing, or a kid could swear they saw something moving under their bed. The young writer, identified only as Mr. L in the account, was ready to throw in the towel and give up when he received a strange correspondence from a man named Terence E. in the summer of 2007. According to Terence, if Mr. L was looking for scary stories, his wife Mary had one that would beat out all the rest, something genuinely terrifying, genuinely paranormal. According to Terence, Mary had experienced a real encounter with the original Smile.jpg image, and nothing has been the same ever since. It just so happened that Terence had contacted exactly the right person, as Mr. L had been fascinated with the concept of Smile Dog ever since he was in the 10th grade back in 2005. He could feel the mystery of the thing drawing him in, the desire to discover what nobody else had discovered before. Terence consulted Mary and she agreed to an informal interview with Mr. L around a month later. The couple were based in Chicago and Mr. L just happened to be in the area on unrelated business. Everything seemed to be falling into place until Mr. L actually arrived at the home. When he got there, eager to conduct his interview and potentially discover the truth behind all this hearsay, Mary had barricaded herself in her bathroom. She appeared to be having some kind of psychotic break, screaming and sobbing uncontrollably, like she was afraid for her very life. In particular, Mary was screaming about some strange nightmare she was experiencing, but it was largely too incoherent to even tell what she was saying. Terence tried his best to console her for Mr. L's interview, but it didn't do any good. From hours of sitting outside the bathroom and taking notes, he only managed to glean the following story. Mary was a system operator for a small Chicago-based bulletin board system back in 1992, when the internet was still in its relative infancy. One day, a seemingly innocent hyperlink was posted on the board system, and she was one of around 400 to actually click the mysterious link, and was immediately transported to smile.jpg. The other people who were exposed on that day remained anonymous and their fates are unknown, but if Mary's accounts and the legends are anything to go by, their stories are unlikely to have had happy endings. As Mr. L pressed for further details, Mary just sobbed and cried harder. The woman was inconsolable, and Mr. L realized he'd probably gotten as much as he was going to get from her. Terence apologized for his wife's strange behavior, and Mr. L thanked him and left. This may have seemed like the end of things for most people, but for Mr. L, this was just the start. The hunt was on, and Mary's brief account had given him the scent. He began gathering all the information he could on the mysterious file, its effects on its victims, and the people it hurt. But as the famous quote from German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche goes, he who fights with monsters should look to it that he himself does not become a monster. And if you gaze long enough into an abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. Mr. L found that information on Smile.jpg wasn't available anywhere on major internet information sources like Wikipedia. In fact, he found that if anyone did attempt to add a reference to the cursed file on a Wikipedia page, it would quickly be struck down by editors. Who was trying to keep this thing buried, and why? He also managed to discover a great deal more about the supposed effects of viewing the file. The most common effects included on the mild end, severe anxiety and persistent night terrors, and on the more severe end, hallucinations and temporal lobe epilepsy, with seizures most commonly occurring at night. Naturally, as with anything on the internet that can cause harm, it was weaponized by trolls and bad actors. The image was often circulated on forums in the early Usenet days, and was allegedly once used to flood the forums of humor and satire website Something Awful back in 2002. The result was a number of users developing severe anxiety, nightmares, and epilepsy. Back in the mid to late 90s, the image circulated as all spooky things on the internet did back then, by chain email. 
The email would disguise itself as one of the number of feel-good chain emails that did the rounds back then, with the innocuous subject line, smile, God loves you, but by the time you've opened the email and its attachment, it's already too late. Plenty of people on the internet claim to have had experiences with Smile Dog, but the veracity of these claims are in dispute. During his investigations, Mr. L did notice some other legends with eerie commonalities to the Smile.jpg tale he was investigating. The most prominent was a story known as The Grinning Man, about a person who received an email from a recently deceased friend with an image of, you guessed it, a grinning man. However, after witnessing the image and an accompanying key phrase, the man's life spiraled out of control, with the only way to lift the apparent curse being to pass it on. From the smiling to the horrific nightmares to the inevitable tragic end, could the two things be connected? There was no conclusive evidence on the matter, but Mr. L was sure to make a note of it for further study. Mr. L continued compiling research for an entire year, always haunted by the cries of Mary coming through the bathroom door and the thought of that smiling hound. He discovered that many of the people who'd originally claimed to see the thing had fallen off the map, and that some had tried to use medication to prevent the nightmares and the epileptic fits that seemed to naturally accompany an incident with the image. All it took was one look, just one little look, to change your life. It felt like a somehow more eerily plausible version of the tape from the ring. At times, Mr. L wondered if the whole thing was just some elaborate hoax, an online inside joke, and it was all on him. Truth be told, he felt almost ready to give up when he finally got a massive break in the case, an email from Mary herself explaining the whole situation. Mr. L eagerly opened the correspondence, excited for his next lead, but what he saw shook him to the core. Mary explained that the image of the smile dog had been haunting her in her sleep for years, repeatedly saying one thing, spread the word, spread the word. She experienced symptoms akin to sleep paralysis, being frozen to the bed and unable to do anything but listen to the words of the demonic dog sitting in front of her. Spread the word. Spread the word. She told Mr. L that a week after initially seeing Smile.jpg, a floppy disk containing the image was mysteriously mailed to her home. Finally, she understood. Much like the grinning man that Mr. L had been investigating, the Smile Dog wanted her to pass the image on and use it to inflict the curse upon others. That would be the only way to stop suffering from the symptoms herself. The nightly seizures and visions she was experiencing were so horrific that she was tempted to pass it on to others, and even contemplated potential options. A co-worker, a stranger, or even her husband Terence. Mary decided against it and instead hid the floppy disk away for years, until she finally found a person she could potentially pass the curse on to, Mr. L himself. However, as she was plotting to pass on the curse to him and ruin his life, she decided against it at the last minute. Hence her breakdown in the bathroom upon his visit. Realizing it's already too late for her and racked with guilt over what she almost did, Mary signed off the email with a harrowing final message for Mr. L. Stop while you are still whole. Later that month, Mr. L received another email from Terence telling him that Mary had taken her own life shortly after sending that last email to him. She just couldn't take the suffering anymore. Terence also informed Mr. L that he'd found and destroyed the floppy disk by setting it on fire, adding that the plastic gave a snake-like hiss as it burnt and shriveled, destroying yet another copy of the cursed image once and for all. Mr. L was ready to hang up his hat and close the investigation into Smile.jpg. People had suffered and even died, and just as Mary had advised him to, he was going to quit while he was ahead. It was a couple months later when he'd almost forced the whole nasty affair out of his mind that he saw a new email appear in his inbox with the subject line, smile. Without even thinking, he clicked on it, and by that point, it was already too late. The text in the body of the email littered with spelling and grammatical errors said, I found your email address through a mailing list to your profile said you're interested in Smile Dog. I have saw it, it is not as bad as everyone says, I have sent it to you here. Just spreading the word. And the rest is spooky internet history. Now you've heard the story and you know all the horrors this strange little photo is said to be able to unleash. Maybe it's all just an urban legend, a hoax, or a mass hysteria. After all, how much damage can one picture do? But hey, if you want to be safe, you can always send this video to a couple friends and spread the word. Working at the SCP Foundation has never been an easy job, but through a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, you've been able to work your way up from being a lowly intern to being a fully-fledged member of the Foundation's science team. Sometimes the work can be tough. After all, most of the SCPs under your supervision are direct threats to humanity. One SCP you never thought you'd have a problem with was 049, also known as the Plague Doctor. SCP-049 is usually cooperative, even sometimes sharing the findings from his research with the science team. 
but today he somehow breached containment, and worse still, he seems to have a problem with you. According to 049, you've been infected with the pestilence. What does that mean? Why is that so dangerous? And what can you do to get this monstrous medieval medic to take a chill pill and go back to his cell without incident? It'll be a tricky task, but it's doable. This is you versus SCP-049, the Plague Doctor. First, let's take a look at what you're up against in a physical sense. The Plague Doctor is a humanoid entity, roughly 190 centimeters or 6 foot 4 inches tall. His imposing stature is only amplified by his appearance. As the name suggests, he appears to be dressed in the thick robes, hat, and beaked mask of a medieval plague doctor. He's usually seen carrying an old-fashioned doctor's bag that seems to contain an infinite number of surgical tools. At the time of his capture, he also wielded a large cane, similar to the kind used by plague doctors, to examine patients from a distance, although this cane was eventually confiscated by Foundation personnel, as is standard procedure for any possessions of anomalies that could potentially be used as weapons. Unlike many SCPs, the Plague Doctor is not only highly intelligent, but capable of being reasoned with, which is a huge point in your favor. SCP-049 speaks in a variety of languages, but his preferences are English and Medieval French. When he was first discovered in the town of Montaubon, France, he willingly went into Foundation custody. This SCP is generally very cooperative and reasonable, particularly with scientists as he considers them to be his peers as fellow men of medicine. In containment, he is regularly provided with corpses on which to perform experiments, and after he completes them, he's often eager to discuss these findings with staff. This cordial relationship makes the Plague Doctor a very manageable prisoner, but don't be fooled, his interactions with staff must be closely monitored. Due to his high intelligence as well as naturally intimidating aura, SCP-049 can be very persuasive to anyone not mentally prepared for an encounter with him. If you aren't careful, you might end up being convinced to, say, give him a human subject for his experimentation, which is strictly forbidden by his containment guidelines. Or as was evidently the case today, he might just be able to convince you to let your guard down and let him out of containment. So the first line of defense against this SCP is to simply not give him a chance to appeal to your ego or engage you in any kind of mind games. Someone less familiar with this SCP might think that letting him out isn't a big deal. Other than being a creepy, super smart humanoid with a magic bag full of strange surgical tools, he doesn't seem actively malicious. What's the harm in giving him a bit of freedom? Well, SCP-049's polite attitude has one very important exception. If he decides a person has been infected with pestilence, he'll become incredibly aggressive toward them. Now, you've worked with the Foundation for a while, so you know the basics of how SCP-049 behaves. When SCP-049 singles you out from your team, you suspect he may have seen you exhibit some kind of symptom, but you know he's generally a creature that can be appealed to with logic. When you notice SCP-049 becoming hostile in your presence, you might try and show him your vaccination records to try and prove that you aren't suffering from any sort of pestilence. However, that's unlikely to work. You see, nobody can quite figure out the criteria that 049 has for what pestilence is, and he has so far refused to explain himself in interviews with the Foundation staff. In fact, 049 gets extremely annoyed if the subject is ever brought up, calling the Foundation doctors simple-minded amateurs for not being able to intuit what the pestilence is, or what the symptoms are. So even if you're all up to date on your measles, tetanus, rabies, and hepatitis shots, and your most recent Foundation issue COVID ah. test came back negative, SCP-049 won't find that sufficient proof that you're pestilence free. What does SCP-049 do to people that he decides have been infected? Well, as he does consider himself a doctor, his stated intention is to cure people. And that's good. But by curing them, we actually mean he kills them. And that's bad. SCP-049 can kill with a single touch, and Foundation personnel have yet to conclusively find out the exact cause of death in any of 049's victims. The most important rule when it comes to surviving a run-in with SCP-049 is to dress for the occasion. SCP-049 can kill anyone instantly just by touching their skin, and if that wasn't bad enough, he's also incredibly fast, able to close the distance between you and him in a matter of seconds. You're no Usain Bolt, so there's probably no way that you'll be able to outrun him. So the best way to prevent your sudden death is by wearing thick clothing that leaves as little skin exposed as possible. As a member of the science team, your lab coat and gloves should do nicely. Keeping your skin safe from unwanted toxins is, after all, what they're designed to do. Tie a scarf or something similar around your neck to protect your throat, and if possible, cover your ears and face with a beanie or ski mask. And if you aren't already wearing them, it might be wise to change into jeans, thick socks, and closed-toed shoes. 
It might be tricky to track all these things down without leaving the office, but trust us, it's essential to surviving an SCP-049 containment breach. His lethal touch is so potent that any exposed skin at all will put you at risk. If you can, donning a full foundation issue hazmat suit definitely wouldn't be an overreaction. Before killing a person that he deems infected with pestilence, SCP-049 will begin by asking typical questions that any doctor would ask a patient about their medical history. Then, with frightening speed, he descends on his victims to deliver his lethal touch. Sometimes killing the person is enough for SCP-049 to consider them cured, but other times it doesn't have the effect that he was going for. SCP-049 will show remorse for the killing, lamenting the fact that the pestilence is still present in some way in his patient, and this is the point where his treatment gets a little more complex and a lot more weird. If you thought being instantly killed with a single touch was bad, you'll really hate hearing about what happens afterward. If the person killed by 049 has decided to still have signs of pestilence, SCP-049 will produce a variety of surgical tools from the doctor's bag that he carries and begin performing surgery on the dead body. The tools used in this surgery vary from scalpels and forceps to a variety of vials and syringes full of fluids that the SCP calls the essence of the four humors. The four humors, in case you aren't aware, were a concept popular in medieval European medicine. The idea is that the body contains four fluids or humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile, and that an imbalance of them is what causes sickness. The idea has obviously been disproven since, but given that 049 resembles a medieval plague doctor and claims to have originated in the 15th century, it makes sense that this idea of treatment would align with medieval beliefs and theories. Once the corpse has been dissected and had its humors thoroughly equalized, a process that usually takes several days, it may then reanimate them as a mindless shambling zombie, known in the Foundation as an SCP-049-2. This doesn't always happen, but when it does, it's always bad news. Even though SCP-049 considers these reanimated people to be cured, he does admit that it isn't a perfect cure, but to us it sounds like a pretty big understatement. Indeed, instances of SCP-049-2 retain no memories or higher brain function, and while they're normally docile, they can become very aggressive if provoked, or if SCP-049 directs them to attack. While 049 obviously prefers to practice his cure on human beings, most instances of 049-2 that you would encounter in the Foundation building would be animals. SCP-049 is given animal corpses to experiment on once every two weeks. These animals are most frequently livestock, particularly cows, but SCP-049 also has experimented on other animals, including an orangutan that he was ultimately unable to revive. Though they behave in an erratic and sometimes violent manner, 049-2 instances are, like most classic movie zombies, relatively easy to put down. There's no evidence in Foundation documents to suggest that anything more than conventional weapons is required to dispatch them. Once dispatched, the corpses should be taken to be incinerated as soon as possible. As for SCP-049 himself, while he's a terrifying and imposing figure, if you can avoid his zombified minions and deadly touch, it's surprisingly easy to get him back into containment. <laughs> Sedatives have been proven to work on this SCP and are part of the standard protocols for transporting him from place to place. Getting a needle through SCP-049's thick leather-like hide may be somewhat <laughs> difficult, especially under duress, so you might want to consider administering the sedative orally. SCP-049 doesn't technically require any sustenance, but he has been seen to enjoy food and believes that eating helps him keep in the right frame of mind to practice his experiments. So if you can bribe him with a snack, you might be able to sneak the sedatives in that way. Some of SCP-049's favorite foods include salted pork, crackers, and hard cheese. So if you can figure out how to hide a pill in any of those, go right ahead and give it a try. <laughs> Additionally, tests have also shown that the application of lavender has a calming effect on this SCP, much like it sometimes does on humans. Lavender contains a compound called linanolol, a type of alcohol that can produce an anti-anxiety effect when inhaled. The effect of linanolol is apparently heightened in the case of SCP-049, because in the SCP's dossier, lavender is the first recommended method for subduing him. Once he's been sedated or otherwise subdued, a locked collar, restraints, and a pair of armed guards are all that's needed to transport him back to containment. So if you followed all these guidelines, you'll be perfectly equipped to survive an encounter with SCP-049. The security team is brought in, 
but as SCP-049 is subdued and led back to his containment cell, he gives you a final cryptic warning. You're denying yourself salvation from the one true sickness that plagues the world of men. If you do not allow me to advance my research, it may be too late to save all those who have been stricken." With those words, the enigmatic and terrifying plague doctor is placed into restraints and escorted back to his cell, the armed guards locking the door behind him. After this encounter, the protocols are changed to discourage any further contact between staff and 049. The day continues as normal, and as soon as you clock off your shift, you decide it might be high time to organize a checkup with your regular doctor, just to be safe. Lately, you've been finding the allure of affordable Swedish flat pack furniture just too strong to resist. So you mosey on down to your local IKEA superstore. Uh -huh. You'll get yourself some nice new furniture and stop by the restaurant for some meatballs at lunch. What could possibly go wrong? Except on your way to find the perfect Klepstad wardrobe, you find you've lost your way. And I mean really lost your way, you have no idea where you are. You might have chalked it up to the confusing store layout or your own terrible sense of direction if it weren't for the seven foot tall faceless monsters in IKEA uniforms wandering around. That's because you're not just trapped in any old IKEA, you're trapped in SCP-3008, the infinite IKEA. What started as a battle to not spend too much money on shelving units has become a battle for your life and freedom. But don't worry, with our help, we can make sure your final resting place isn't an IKEA Tomrefjord bed. First, some important ground rules. This is going to be a little different to some of our other U vs videos because, simply put, you can't defeat or kill SCP-3008, only escape or survive it. Unlike a number of battles against the frightening creatures and entities of the SCP Foundation, you won't have Foundation knowledge, personnel, resources, or weapons to help you. So no heavily armed SWAT teams or backup Predator drones, but don't let that dishearten you. After all, you'll be in the largest IKEA known to man, so you won't have to look far to find the comforts of home or potential improvised weapons. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves, after all, it doesn't matter how many weapons you have. If you don't understand your enemy first, an AK-47 might as well be a BB gun. SCP-3008 is technically the umbrella term for two different kinds of dangerous anomaly, both of which you'll be facing up against today, SCP-3008-1 and SCP-3008-2. SCP-3008-1 is the specific term for the anomalous section of the story you're currently trapped in. The gateway to this particular area is always situated in a seemingly normal IKEA superstore, and its size is estimated to be anywhere between 10 square kilometers and infinity itself. Thankfully, escape from this area isn't unprecedented, as the SCP Foundation has recorded at least 14 successful escapes since they first brought the area into containment. We won't crush your spirits by telling you how small the portion of the overall amount trapped inside that is, but it's comforting to know that at least you have an above 0% chance of getting out of this situation alive. But the things that'll make it a lot harder are SCP-3008-2 dangerous humanoid entities known to the prisoners of SCP-3008-1 as the staff. And while the thought of IKEA staff probably brings to mind smiling, helpful people in yellow shirts and blue pants, that thought couldn't be more wrong here. Well, apart from the yellow shirts and blue pants, these things still had those. The first thing you'll likely notice about the staff inside of SCP-3008 is their freakish proportions. They're described as either being too tall or too short, so you'll have to be on the lookout above and below. The staff also tend to have long, powerful limbs with large hands that allow them to grab prey, such as yourself, at an impressive distance. They also seem to lack any kind of facial features, blood, bones, or internal organs. It seems less obvious than some of the other advantages possessed by the staff, like their strength or numerical superiority, but the first thing they have on you is psychological. As a normal and at least somewhat sane human being, seeing monsters without faces running around is likely going to be a shock to you. Even more than that, considering you're lost and disoriented, nobody could blame you for being afraid of the staff either. The problem here is that fear tends to either lead to panic or hesitation. And if one or even a few of these things are bearing down on you and you freeze up even for a second, chances are that you're probably a goner. That's why stealing your nerves, keeping your wits about you, and cultivating a strong survival instinct is key to survival while trapped in SCP-3008. And now some good news before you get it into your head that you won't be leaving this IKEA alive anytime soon. While the staff can be frightening and even deadly in the right circumstances, they're not in a constant attack mode. Even though SCP-3008-1 is entirely indoors, the automatic lighting up above simulates periods of day and night, while the staff are incredibly hostile during 
during the nighttime periods, they're shown to be docile and unresponsive during the day. We still wouldn't recommend attempting a sneak attack on them during the day, as they've been known to react violently to attack at all times. But you can at least use the daytime periods to prepare yourself for later combat. Not only can you use this time to get used to seeing them and thus reduce your fear of them during nighttime skirmishes, you can also collect weapons, intel, and supplies while the creatures are docile. Then, when night falls and you're ready to fight, you'll probably be happy to hear that while the creatures do wield impressive physical strength in seemingly unlimited numbers, they only have the endurance of your average human. In other words, anything that can kill you can also kill them, giving you a slightly more even playing field. This brings us to the fun part, weapons. Luckily for you, seeing as you're in a potentially limitless version of one of your largest home retailers in the world, you have plenty of options for arming yourself. While grabbing enough large heavy objects to turn yourself into a Swedish flat pack Conan the Barbarian might seem like a good idea, we personally recommend keeping it a little simpler. Having a light loadout allows for speedy movement and maneuverability, so what could be better than the blades of an IKEA 365 Plus 3-piece kitchen knife set and a sturdy claw hammer from the 17-piece fix-a-tool kit? While trying to avoid the staff at night is probably your best option, if one of them does somehow end up getting all up close and personal, it likely won't survive getting a kitchen knife rammed through its faceless skull. Thankfully, you at least have the element of stealth on your side, as the staff constantly repeat the phrase, the store is now closed, please exit the building while in attack mode. Even if you don't have a chance to run and hide, that'll at least give you a window to warm up your hammering arm. Of course, while being able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the staff is definitely an essential skill if you want to survive your SCP-3008 experience, you can't afford to stop there. After all, people can spend entire years trapped inside the store, and while you can hope to be out of here a lot sooner than that, it'll probably dawn on you long before that that you can't survive by eating knives and hammers. Thankfully, SCP-3008 actually has you covered there as there appears to be multiple IKEA restaurants and food service areas where supplies are periodically restocked. This is where you'll need to restock if you don't want to starve before you even get a chance to escape. But you might think, can I really rely on this? After all, with the place as easy to get lost in as SCP-3008, might it be whole days between finding adequate food supplies? And good, that's the kind of practical thinking that'll get you out of here alive. Thankfully, you can take some extra food with you each time with the help of an IKEA Shilvaska cooling bag and some IKEA Shilklamp cold packs. This will give you some rations to keep with you during your travels and escape attempts, and it'll also give you some valuables to exchange and trade. That's right, because as luck would have it, you're far from the only one stuck in this weird Swedish mess. There are actually so many people trapped in SCP-3008 that they've essentially been able to construct an entire new civilization inside the store. Whole townships and settlements have been built and fortified entirely with IKEA furniture, full of thriving little populations doing what they can to get by in this strange new world. If you're thinking, I don't have time to make friends, I want to get out of here as soon as possible, you might as well hand yourself over to the staff now and get your mauling over with. As the old truism goes, there's safety in numbers, and even the luckiest people to escape SCP-3008 have at the very least spent a few weeks inside. In that time, unless you want to go insane or die from exhaustion, you're gonna need to sleep. If you try the lone wolf method and sleep on one of the display beds out in the open, you're extremely vulnerable to attacks from the staff while you sleep. But if you manage to get yourself into one of the human settlements inside SB3008 and start making some friends, you'll have the benefit of cover while you rest and sleep, so long as you're willing to help return the favor from time to time. People holed up in these fortified settlements have observed that at least a few nights each week the staff are likely to swarm and attack said settlements in large numbers. When that happens, if you want to survive, you're gonna need to help your human allies hold the line against the oncoming horde of faceless monsters by any means necessary. And after for each battle, you'll need to help your new friends haul the staff corpses to elsewhere in the store. Detecting even part of one of their own in your settlement's proximity can cause them to frenzy and launch even more brutal attacks, which as someone who wants to survive this whole thing, you really don't want. With all these other issues, from food and social interaction and rest to successfully fighting off the staff squared away, it's time to move on to the main event actually escaping the place. As we stated before, while it isn't easy, it can be done. You just need to be both persistent and tactical about it. 
First of all, it's best to communicate with some of your fellow humans trapped inside SCP-3008 to see if any of them can recall any memorable details about when they first entered the anomalous zone. Another key marker in attempting to escape this place is SCP Foundation drones. The Foundation has been using remote-controlled recon drones to explore the interior of SCP-3008, and tracking the movements and directions of these drones might make it a little easier to find a way out of here. Finally, it's time to put boots on the ground and actually find your way to one of the exits. It would be productive to team up with some trusted humans and form an expeditionary party, allowing you to collectively carry more supplies and defend one another if night falls and you're left vulnerable to attacks from the staff. But in a place that could potentially be infinite, and in a store with as confusing layout as an IKEA, how can you be sure you're not just walking around in circles? Simple! All you need to do is get your hands on plenty of IKEA Behandla black glazing paint and some IKEA fix-up paintbrushes. If you paint a black line down each aisle you explore, you suddenly have a route that you can both double back on to a settlement if necessary and ensure you won't be going in circles. Almost like the classic Hansel and Gretel breadcrumb trail, you can perform more expeditions every day, pushing out a little further each time, covering and marking out more ground, and if you follow the rest of the instructions here you'll stay well fed, well rested, and survive the staff, maybe even make some friends, but most importantly, you'll have a much higher chance of finally escaping this flat pack nightmare. When that eventually does happen, you and your party will likely be greeted, detained, and debriefed by some SCP Foundation field operatives. Once you've delivered all relevant information over to them, you'll be given SCP Foundation amnestics and be made to forget the whole thing ever happened. The Foundation will transport you back to your underfurnished room safe and sound, with nothing but a lingering thought that it might just be better to do all your furniture shopping online in the future. It's never easy being the new guy. You keep forgetting people's names. You still need to get to grips with office politics, and the senior staff keep eating your pudding cups out of the office fridge even though they were clearly labeled with your name. And if you think being a regular new guy is tough, then you can only imagine the terror of being the greenest employee at the SCP Foundation. As a humble research assistant, you feel like you're basically one rung above D-Class. You're itching for a chance to prove your mettle and climb the ranks, and lucky for you, you're about to get that chance. Ok, well, lucky may be a funny way of putting it. You were so wrapped up in mourning the pudding cup that you're pretty sure you saw Dr. Dan eating earlier that day that you didn't even notice the alarms for a containment breach going off. You also barely registered the faint hiss like a chemical burn as a black scorch mark began to spread across the wall behind you. It's only when you can smell the unmistakable stench of rotting human flesh that you put down your empty pudding cup and turn to see something horrifying standing right behind you. It's the yellow toothed grin of a decaying old man oozing his way through the wall. That's right, you're face to face with SCP-106. One of two things can happen right now. Uncle Larry here can grab you with his dirty gray fingers and introduce you to the kind of pain that would make Pinhead from Hellraiser blush, or you can think fast, remember your foundation training, survive the night, and perhaps even help your co-workers get this wall-walking monster back into containment. Then you might finally get the respect you deserve around here. You swallow your fear, steal your nerves, and try to recall everything they taught you about this creep during orientation. Keep your wits about you, and keep your eyes on the walls. This is you versus SCP-106, aka the Old Man. Theoretically, you have all the knowledge you need to survive this containment breach. But while we were reading the intro, the old man managed to fully seep in through the walls, and now he's heading right for you. Our first piece of advice is to turn tail and run like hell, putting some major distance between you and him. SCP-106 has proven pretty much immune to all physical damage, so even if you're packing knives, guns, and a Bruce Lee level of combat efficacy, it's better to just not engage. Despite this appearance as a frail old man who'd been left dead in a ditch for two months, this creature is incredibly strong. He's dealt out massive physical trauma to victims in a matter of seconds once he's gotten his hands on them, and what comes after is even worse. But we'll get to that later. For now, you run out of the room and bolt around a corner. You realize security has probably been deployed elsewhere and just hope that they can get to you in time. Though seeing as SCP-106 can shrug off machine gun fire like spitballs, they're probably more the illusion of security than the real thing. In fact, you don't even bother closing the doors behind you as you run because it's not like this thing even uses doors. There's almost no physical barrier that can keep the old man from getting his hands on his favorite prey. Terrified running humans, for example, you. While you're putting the pedal to the metal and trying to get away from the 
this sadistic freak as quickly as possible, here's a little background on what you're up against. SCP-106 is an extremely dangerous Keter-class anomaly that's operated as far back as World War I, when he's believed to have been created. For the uninitiated, the Keter class is reserved for the anomalies that are exceptionally hard to contain and require complex and extensive methods to do so, and SCP-106 earns that classification with its truly exceptional skills as an escape artist. It's believed to be capable of, if given enough time, passing through any form of solid matter. Doors? No problem. Walls? Forget about it. Think even a 10-foot thick brick of concrete can keep him away? You're in for a world of pain, my friend. In terms of its ability to walk through solid matter, there are only three things that may work to your advantage here. Tests on SCP-106 have shown that it has a certain aversion to lead. Lead won't hurt it or entirely stop it, but it'll slow him down for long enough to formulate a plan of action. SCP-106 also appears to become confused when it's required to pass through more complex physical structures. For example, it would be far easier to pass through a simple wall than, say, a car, where there's a variety of shapes and materials at play. The old man has also shown pronounced aversion to liquid, which also caused it to become confused. It's for all these reasons that its containment area is comprised of 16 spherical cells, each filled with various fluids and a random assembly of surfaces and supports to keep the capricious old man too confused to attempt regular containment breaches. 106 is an ambush predator at heart, sometimes waiting completely motionless months at a time but it only needs a few key seconds to turn the tables on its captors. Its attacks are most likely to occur just after the people observing it let their guard down. Again, we have to reiterate, there's no way you can fight this creature. You have to play defensive, or you'll end up as a plaything to one of the most sadistic creatures under the Foundation's lock and key. Despite its rotted appearance, the old man is no mindless zombie. He's one of the more intelligent and cunning creatures you'd be unlucky to run afoul of while working on a Foundation containment site. There's a killer instinct behind those black shark-like eyes and that toothy, lipless grin. Before you're ready to survive this nightmare, you need to first understand all the numerous ways the old man can murder you. As we mentioned before, while the old man isn't exactly a martial artist in the agility department, he is freakishly strong. If the old man catches you in his deathly tight grip, there's probably no saving you. He'll likely tenderize your body and incapacitate you by attacking major organs, muscle groups, and tendons. We wouldn't advise screaming for help as he does this, because you'll probably just excite him. After all, SCP-106 doesn't hunt out of hunger. We haven't even seen the creature eat. 106 hunts because of desire, and that desire is to cause maximum pain and suffering in his victims. His entire body is also covered in a kind of powerful, corrosive mucus that can be dangerous to both objects and organic tissue, and the burning caused by said acidic mucus oh. won't abate until around 6 hours after first contact. So even touching SCP-106 is a huge no-no if you want to get out of this containment breach intact. But the horror won't end there. No, once you're in his clutches, it's just the beginning of your terrible ordeal. Once you've been sufficiently incapacitated, you'll see that the old man is sinking back through the wall and taking you with him. And I'm sorry to say that where you're going isn't just the other side of the wall, you're being dragged into the old man's pocket dimension. This is SCP-106's lair, a little universe of endless dark corridors where he has absolute control. And if you're in there and somehow watching this video on otherworldly 5G, then I'm afraid it's probably already too late for you. In the pocket dimension, 106 has total mastery over space-time. You can be trapped, hunted, and tortured for what feels like centuries on end. If it's feeling particularly cruel or bored, it might let you go for a little while just to hunt you down and trap you again. People who have finally been released from the pocket dimension are often dead or on the edge of death, heavily mutilated with their faces locked into a final agonized scream. The only consolation for any of these people is that they probably lost their minds long before they died. To SCP-106, it's all just a sick, twisted little game. If you want to survive, you can't play his game. The old man wants to be entertained by your fear and suffering, so if you scream and flail and panic, you're just going to encourage him. As hard as it is, you need to adopt a steely calm if you want to maximize your chances of surviving the breach. As you run from him, try to stay in the absolute middle of the hallway. When the old man enters his pocket dimension, which must always be against a solid surface, he can re-emerge from any point connected to the initial entry point. In other words, he can merge into the wall on one end of a long hallway and instantaneously appear on the other end cutting you off. You're not even immune to attacks from above as SCP-106 is able to walk across the ceiling for an indefinite period of time. Being 100% aware of everything around you at all times is the only way to ensure your survival. 
If you can, get out of the narrow corridors of the Foundation's hallways and find your way into a more open area with high ceilings as soon as possible. 106 is less likely to hedge you off there, and if you can maintain vigilance, you'll be able to see him coming and get a head start. Of course, you can't run forever, and the patient old man is positively counting on that. Your next mission will be to rendezvous with your colleagues and commence the grisly containment procedures, but that's not so easy with 106 on your tail. One proven method of buying time against the monster is exposing it to extremely bright light. While once again this light cannot cause 106 any actual harm, it may startle the creature and cause it to retreat back into its pocket dimension. When the old man is hiding, that's when you have a golden opportunity to grab a member of D-Class personnel and drag them into the vacant containment chamber. What comes next isn't pretty, but it's the only tried and true method of getting this thing back into containment, so you may need to leave your morals and empathy at the door. While 106 is still distracted, you'll need to subdue the D-Class and set up a direct feed to the building's intercom. The Foundation has found that the best way to lure the old man back into containment is with the prospect of causing more suffering. In order to do this, you essentially need to torture the D-Class until they scream into the microphone, showing a certain rotting, grinning sadist that there's fun to be had back in the containment chamber. It's recommended that you mutilate the D-Class at intervals of 20 minutes in order to give the old man enough time to hear the screams and estimate the location of their source. Not a natural-born torturer? Don't worry, if you don't like the idea of slashing a man's tendons yourself, you can make use of a special hydraulic press they keep on site, lovingly nicknamed the Femur Breaker. To wring some screams out of your unfortunate D-Class, once the screaming begins, it's time to vacate the area and wait. When inevitably SCP-106 returns to enjoy the little treat you left for him, it's time to seal the containment behind him. The screams of the D-Class you sacrificed might haunt you until your dying day, but at least your dying day won't be today, thanks to the tips and techniques you've learned here. Thanks to your excellent handling of the latest containment breach, you might be lucky enough to find yourself promoted from assistant to junior researcher, meaning you'll be spending even more time with charming little creatures like SCP-106. So just keep the things you've learned here today in mind. After all, you may be needing them again real soon. It's impossible to read the news now without hearing about viruses. As one pandemic runs its course, there are menacing headlines about others possibly cropping up. But as you browse the internet, you may come across people talking about something called X-Virus. Is this a new and deadly plague making its way over from unknown quarters? No, X-Virus isn't a virus at all, but it may be no less terrifying. No one knows where X-Virus came from, but he introduced himself to us in a short story that began circulating around the internet. But the strange thing is, X-Virus doesn't seem creepy at first. He is a little boy, one who had a rough life and maybe, just maybe, will finally find the friend he needs. Sounds cheery enough, right? Why has X-Virus captured the attention of creepypasta fans everywhere? And could he have ties to one of the most notorious monsters in internet history? X-Virus wants you to know his story. He started out as a boy named Cody, and he describes himself as an unwanted kid. He never knew his father, who likely abandoned the family, but at least he had his mother, right? Wrong. His mother was a career criminal and was hardly fit for raising a child. She would go out to commit crimes, the younger Cody never described what they were, and left Cody alone. He would sit at home, waiting for her to come back. Sometimes days, but eventually even weeks at a time alone. Cody never had any friends, and being alone was a way of life for him. Until one day, there was a knock on the door. It was a social worker. Would things start looking up for Cody? It was clear to the social worker that Cody's mother wasn't fit to take care of him, and so he went into the custody of the state. They took Cody to a group home where he hoped he would be able to start fresh, far away from his traumatic upbringing. He even looked forward to making some friends, but it wasn't to be. From the moment Cody arrived at the orphanage, everything went wrong. He was ostracized by the other kids and felt intimidated by them. He was too scared to talk to anyone, so he just sat on a chair and stared at them. It was just like being in his old home. Although he was surrounded by people now, he was still alone. Then one day, he was told to pack by the people at the orphanage. Where was he going now? For once, it didn't seem like bad news. Cody was going to be adopted. He was surprised, as parents usually favored younger kids, and he was already 13 years old. He thought of himself as a weirdo and couldn't believe a set of parents wanted him, but the adoption papers were signed and he was taken away to meet his new family. And when he approached his new home, he couldn't believe his eyes. It was a mansion, the biggest home he had ever seen. But all wasn't as it seemed inside of Cody's new home. 
Cody was given his own room, much nicer than one he'd ever had, but once more was living all alone. Then one day he was introduced to the man who adopted him. He was a scientist, the head of a major laboratory specializing in microbiology. He studied the behavior of dangerous viruses, and his job kept him very busy. He wouldn't be spending much time at home, and Cody immediately worried that he would be just left alone like he'd been with his mother. Cody would do anything to keep that from happening again, so he tried to win his new father's favor. He expressed interest in the scientist's work and volunteered to help him with the work in the lab. Soon, Cody's adoptive father began opening up to him, explaining to the curious boy what his work was about and how dangerous a virus could be. Cody was about to find out firsthand. Cody had a chance at a normal life, going to school with other kids, but his social troubles continued. He never fit in and preferred to spend his time in the adopted father's lab. He started keeping a work journal where he kept his personal sketches and formulas. The years went on, and by the time Cody was 17, he was an expert in viruses. But his father kept a close eye on him and never let him experiment on his own, only allowing him to assist in planned tests. But Cody was getting more and more curious. He decided it was time to start his own experiments. Cody had designed his own custom viruses and compounds, and he wanted to know what they would do when injected into a living being. So he started gathering test subjects, mostly rats and other small animals. He would inject them, and they would die soon after, confirming how dangerous the viruses he used were. But it was how they died that intrigued Cody the most. In the moment before death, they would let out a horrible high-pitched noise, almost like their lungs were about to explode. Cody wondered what caused this. He wondered what noise a human would make if it happened to them. Cody started thinking about how he could find out. He didn't have any friends at school. When he talked to the kids about his work with viruses, they were disturbed and stopped talking to him. He knew he would have to act alone, so Cody waited until his father was away. He took a lethal virus and filled up a syringe with it. He was going hunting, but he knew he couldn't let himself be seen. He needed to disguise himself. And so Cody disappeared, and something new and terrible was born. He dressed in a black jacket and jeans and took his old baseball bat out of the basement. Finding a jar with rusty nails in it, he nailed them into the bat, turning it into a deadly weapon. Finally, he put on an old gas mask and a pair of protective goggles. He was ready to kill and went to a neighborhood very different from his own. It was full of old, run-down houses, very much like the one he grew up in. He wasn't looking for anyone in particular. Any old house would do as long as there was someone alive inside. He kicked down the door and the horror was about to begin. Cody swung like a professional, targeting people one by one in his murder spree. They weren't expecting an attack, and no one in the house stood a chance. Finally, there was only one left, a middle-aged man who Cody tied up. As soon as the man was trapped, Cody injected him with the virus and watched, waiting for his darkest questions to be answered. First, the man stayed still, terrified. Then he started groaning louder and louder. He sounded like an animal as he moaned, the life leaving him, until he fell on the floor dead. Cody had his answer, and he knew he couldn't stop now. But he'd been discovered. Cody's adopted father was waiting for him, angry that his son had snuck out. But Cody wasn't worried. His father was a scientist just like him. He would understand, right? Cody opened up to his father, explaining about his experiments and how he had finally lived his dream of snuffing out a human life. He was excited, maybe he and his father would work together on more experiments like this. But his father was horrified. He couldn't believe what his son had become, and he looked at Cody with the same look of disgust Cody had seen from his classmates so many times. He knew what he had to do, call the police. It was the last move he would ever make. Cody leaped up and smashed his father's head with a deadly bat, killing him quickly. He took his father's ID badge for the lab and ran. He knew what he was looking for, supplies that could help him live his passion. He took as many samples of deadly viruses as he could, along with enough syringes to hold them all. He knew he had to run, but the lure of that dingy old neighborhood was calling him. He wanted to test out his new wares on some unexpecting victims. One by one, he paid a visit to different homes and watched as people died horribly. The police would have heard about this by now, and Cody knew he had to hide. He went into the woods where he thought he'd be alone, but he wasn't. He wasn't even the only strange boy in these woods. Then, one day a figure approached him, wearing orange glasses and what looked like a muzzle. While Cody carried a bat with nails, this new boy carried a pair of axes. They viewed each other cautiously, but eventually the new boy approached Cody. He told Cody he didn't need to fear him, and introduced himself as Toby. As Toby asked him his name, Cody knew he had found a friend, even a blood brother for the first time, and he also knew that it was time for a new name that reflected what he had become. X-Virus Who is Toby? And are there two serial killer kids out there tormenting people with axes, spiked bats, and deadly viruses? Well, we hope not. 
But as for who X-Virus's new friend is, that's a complicated question in itself. X-Virus isn't just a creepypasta, he's part of a crossover. Toby, or Tiki Toby as he's better known, is one of the more famous creepypastas himself. Another boy with a dark past who had dealt with abusive parents and trauma from a car crash, he eventually became a killer himself. He was presumed dead in a fire, but the truth was more complicated because Toby had become a proxy. A proxy killer for one of the most notorious internet monsters of all time, Slender Man. A gangly, white-skinned monster wearing a black suit, he's notorious for stalking and abducting people and has appeared in hundreds of works of fiction. He even had a video game and a movie based around him. But he's all fiction, right? Well, that depends on how you look at it. Slenderman is so popular that while the original creature may have been a work of fiction by something off of forum user Eric Knudsen, he's taken on a life of his own. Photoshopped pictures tie him to real-life abduction, the mythology is spread to unaware teenagers, and real crimes have occurred because of his legend. In Wisconsin, two preteen girls attempted to murder their friend as a sacrifice to Slenderman. The victim Peyton Lettner survived and both her attackers were sent to mental institutions. Unlike most creepypastas, Slenderman almost had a body count. The would-be killers were just children, just like X-Virus and Tiki Toby. But where did X-Virus come from? That's a complicated question. Like many creepypastas, there's no obvious source, and most people read X-Virus's manifesto when it was reposted on the internet by random people. The original story can be traced to Spanish-speaking artist Mama Porcupine, who initially posted it on her Twitter and drew fan art of X-Virus and Tiki Toby on DeviantArt. But the characters have taken on a life of their own, with hundreds of stories about them written by other creators and posted around the internet. X-Virus may have originated as just a random scary story, but he spread regardless of the creator's plans. Just like a virus. You've finally done it. Your greatest desire, your lifelong dream, has finally come to fruition. You've gotten yourself a job at Paws Inc., the company that owns the iconic Garfield comics. That's right, it's your job to make sure that America's favorite lazy orange cat still reaches his adoring fans every single day. But before you get too excited, being this close to the process behind Garfield's creation puts you squarely in the sights of SCP-3166. Because here's the thing, while Garfield has always been an iconic piece of American pop culture since Jim Davis created him in 1976, his popularity and profitability really aren't what they used to be. And that's exactly when you, as a Garfield-loving intern, are in the most danger. That's because SCP-3166 is a nightmarish pataphysical entity that manifests and stalks people involved in the Garfield media empire whenever the franchise isn't doing so well in the public eye. And that's why you are in terrible danger. Because when SCP-3166 gets its hands on you, you're in for a pretty terrible death. But never fear, Garfield may hate Mondays, but that doesn't mean he's going to be able to ruin yours. We're here to give you the tips, tricks, and tactics to battle the lasagna cat to the death and still come out swinging. Or at least stay alive long enough for agents from the SCP Foundation to swoop in and save you. Welcome to You vs. SCP-3166. You know the drill around here, folks. You can't fight what you can't understand. While this huge orange monster might be reminiscent of your favorite lethargic feline, if you underestimate it, you're liable to be found pounded to a pulp or choking on a mouthful of cold pasta. At face value, the creature seems to be an extremely low-effort, seven-foot-tall Garfield cosplayer with a ragged orange suit that's made from actual cat fur. However, this isn't so much a suit as it is the creature's actual skin, and on the inside, it's lasagna all the way down. The creature has no bone structure, making it basically immune to most forms of blunt force trauma. Like many of the anomalous creatures dealt with by the Foundation, SCP-3166 shouldn't logically be able to do anything that it does. You're dealing with a being here that does not follow the basic laws of biology. And to make matters more disgusting, it's been found that the meat within SCP-3166's lasagna is genetically identical to the flesh of Garfield creator Jim Davis. So, in a sense, this horrific orange abomination is a child of Mr. Davis, much like the original Garfield was his brainchild. Why is all this relevant to a combat situation involving SCP-3166? Allow us to school you in a little Combat 101. A real fight is never a purely logical affair, and oftentimes in the heat of the moment, good situational awareness and psychological preparation will win out over a solid battle plan. When you see this towering Garfield-esque nightmare shambling toward you in the dark, your first reaction is going to be fear. 
you've never seen anything like this. You might even freeze while you're trying to process it all and lose valuable seconds that could be spent running away. And that right there is SCP-3166's first advantage against you. Its frightening and disgusting appearance is likely to instill a sense of psychological terror, which is something you can't use back against a mindless monster. Being aware of what you're dealing with in a situation like this can make all the difference between life and death. However, elements of this can also work in your favor. Another rule of combat is that every advantage comes with its own disadvantage and vice versa. Do you know what you get when you fuse rotting pasta with real damp cat fur? One real nasty stink. While you could make the argument that going on the stank offensive would improve its fighting chances by distracting you, it also serves as an advanced warning system for when SCP-3166 is approaching. When you suddenly get a whiff of the most noxious wet cat and meat stench that you've smelled in your life, you know it's time to enter fight or flight mode. But you might not always be that lucky. One of the most dangerous aspects of SCP-3166 is its ability to manifest near its targets from thin air and then demanifest when its deadly work is done. That means it can appear right behind you at any time ready to strike. So you'll need to maintain constant vigilance if you want to survive a potential encounter and prevent it from getting its big meaty paws on you. You're probably wondering, what would a close encounter with SCP-3166 actually look like? Compared to some of the more complex and metaphysical attacks of its fellow SCPs, there's a kind of brutal but effective simplicity to SCP-3166's attacks. Its main form of offense is grabbing a nearby heavy object and bludgeoning you to death with it, all while making meowing, purring, and screeching noises like an extremely agitated cat. Obviously, nobody wants to have their head bashed in with a commemorative Garfield snow globe. But the most upsetting way this creature dispatches its victims is by disemboweling itself and forcing fistfuls of lasagna down your helpless throat until you choke to death or die from overfeeding. This would be a disgusting way to go even with normal lasagna, but with Jim Davis flesh lasagna it's a special kind of torture that would make almost any other form of death seem preferable. But don't let this frighten you, because remember being frightened is the first step to losing your edge. Just take the threat of being beaten or force fed to death as motivation to never lose the upper hand. Now that you understand what you're up against, let's talk strategies for survival and maybe even defeating this lasagna filled menace. The first option is the simplest running. Booking it the second you see a grim mess of orange fur lumbering toward you might seem like the coward's way out, but it's better to be cowardly than dead. While the creature definitely has a clear size advantage on you, it comes with a drawback of lowering its speed. If you manage to spot or smell it approaching and you've been keeping up with your cardio at the gym, you can turn tail and run for it. If you manage to survive for long enough on evasive tactics alone, then maybe some SCP Foundation field agents will mobilize in time and take care of the threat for you. You'll probably even get some sweet amnestics out of the deal, so the lingering trauma of your SCP-3166 incident won't hang over you until your dying days. However, running isn't always a luxury you can afford. What if SCP-3166 manifested in your home in the middle of the night, leaving you with nowhere to run? At that point, taking the fight to him is the only option, unless you want to die a horrific and carby death. But how do you fight a giant homicidal Garfield creature? We know that you can't use blunt force trauma because the lasagna cat has no bones to break. But what about bladed weapons? Could you take down this creature with knives and swords? The idea of going Kill Bill on SCP-3166 is definitely appealing, but aside from the potential value of removing limbs to slow the creature down, this method might not be as helpful as one would hope. We know the creature is able to disembowel itself in order to pull out its Jim Davis lasagna innards and force feed people, so it stands to reason that you jumping the gun and doing the disemboweling yourself might not be an effective method of putting this thing down. If blades and heavy blunt objects are ineffective weapons, how about we try something a little more modern? That's right. We're talking firearms. A few important notes. SCP-3166 has no blood, and therefore the intention should not be to fatally wound and let it bleed out. Such a thing isn't possible. What you need is a gun that can do massive structural damage and maybe incapacitate or at least slow down the creature. Because of this, small caliber pistols and rifles are out. Personally, we'd recommend shouldering a powerful shotgun in your battle against SCP-3166, the kind that could comfortably splatter a leg into saucy paste and slow the monster's otherwise relentless pursuit. 
Also, while there's no way we can guarantee that this would really make a difference, there's rarely any harm in going for the classic headshot. Even if this isn't the most effective attack in the world, splattering this thing's head all over the walls would at least be a pretty satisfying gesture. If you can pump enough rounds into 3166 to at least slow it to a crawl, you can run away at a more leisurely pace rather than a terrified sprint. However, guns aren't always readily available or easy to access. What if you need an alternative method for bringing down this monster? To quote an old internet proverb, kill it with fire. It's a weapon that both cats and lasagna are vulnerable to. Provided, of course, you're not inside your own home or surrounded by flammable objects, it's likely that dousing the beast in gasoline and tossing a match would reduce it to cinders. And considering all the lasagna you'd be burning in the process, it might even smell a little nice. Just try to forget that it's technically burning human flesh flesh you're smelling there. But what if you're really unlucky and this thing just walks out of the fire dripping with pasta and minced beef but very much alive? Kinda like an Italian Terminator. Thankfully, when all other methods of keeping SCP-3166 at bay fail, there is one fail-safe maneuver for distracting this SCP that has been tried and tested by Foundation personnel. As with many things in life, sometimes you need to look within to find the answers. Except this time you're not looking within yourself, you're looking within the enemy. Much like the gluttonous orange cat from which it takes its form, SCP-3166 has one weakness, lasagna. Since the majority of its biomass consists of the cheesy pasta staple, anytime other sources of lasagna are placed nearby, the creature cannot help but seek it out to integrate it into its own body. Therefore, strategically placed distraction lasagnas are the only dependable method of keeping the beast off your tail for long enough to ensure a speedy escape. And from what we've been able to tell, the type of lasagna doesn't matter. So stock up on a few dozen 99-cent microwavable lasagnas, and you might just survive long enough for an SCP Foundation mobile task force to swoop in and take this entire problem off your hands. Once the SCP Foundation's there, the anomaly will be apprehended and dispatched, and you'll be given a comforting dose of amnestics to help you forget this whole nasty event even occurred. You'll be able to pick up where you left off in your fabulous new job at Paws Inc making sure America gets its daily Garfield fix no matter what. Except now, when you see the grinning orange feline, you can't help but feel a twitch in your eye, even though you have no idea why. But I wouldn't worry about it. After all, what you don't know can't hurt you. A young man sits in his bedroom late at night, his glum face illuminated by the light of a computer screen. Man, he feels bored. He's sick and tired of scrolling through social media posts that detail his friends' allegedly perfect lives. He's done with politics and left and right and everything that's wrong in the real world. He wants to escape, and then he finds it, a video written, designed, and produced by the Infographic Show. It's a list of the scariest creepypastas on the internet. What will this young man learn as he's listening to this gripping list of well-told lies? He'll learn that there are some utterly frightening and disturbing stories out there, tales that lie like bloodied broken car wrecks on the information superhighway. Number 10. Jeff the Killer Okay, so some of you creepy pasta fans will be thinking, come on, Jeff the Killer deserves to be higher than number 10. Well, we do think it's good. It's deranged. It's creepy enough for sure. But we also think there are better stories out there. The rest of you will be thinking, who the hell's Jeff the Killer? Good question. Let us explain. Jeff the Killer is a kid with an annoying mom who's likely got a bad case of narcissistic personality disorder. Jeff has his own mental problems too, and it doesn't take very long for the story to show them off. He has a fight, and you might say that Jeff goes a bit overboard with the violence thing. He protects his brother from receiving a good old-fashioned beatdown from some kids who live on the street Jeff's family just moved on to. Jeff is evidently a bit messed up from his mom and pop, and he doesn't seem to have embraced the family move. On top of that, he keeps having these small trance-like psychosexual episodes described simply as a weird feeling. He beats up those kids on the block while waiting at a bus stop. He does this with a plum, easily taking out a stereotypically cool kid, fat kid, and thin kid, and nerdy kid. Young Jeff breaks their bones and uses a knife he's taken off one of the kids, all in a morning's work in this white picket fence neighborhood. Jeff's brother takes the blame for the vicious beating. He gets carted off to prison and the family deals with it so well they're at a party not long after. His mom is so unaffected by losing a son to prison she almost seems perverse. She waltzes into Jeff's bedroom one day and announces to him that it's party time. That said, party is full of overbearing, to Jeff, alcoholic parents. Jeff retreats to the garden, but doesn't find much solace in there since it's full of small kids, one with a speech impediment. Believe it or not, the gang that Jeff single-handedly broke to pieces shows up in the garden. 
What ensues is an end of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood style beatdown in which Jeff yet again proves that he's good with his hands. Guns are pulled, yeah, those little school kids are armed and ready to shoot. Parents scream and prove to be eternally ineffective. The fight's crescendo involves implausibly flammable vodka and Jeff's face going missing. The best part of the story is when Jeff pulls off the bandages and finds his face is like shiny white leather and he no longer has eyelids. And then the story says, Jeff, said Louis' brother, it's not that bad. Not that bad, said Jeff, it's perfect. Naturally, he lets out a mad laugh at that point. Fast forward to the next chance Jeff gets to make use of a kitchen knife and the scene in the family bathroom. Jeff's mom walks in on him and she sees her son has carved a Glasgow smile into his face. He goes on a stabbing spree which ends with his brother. Sticking the blade into him, Jeff says his tagline, go to sleep. That's pretty much what he'll say to you just before he sticks the cold metal into your chest. Do stories get any better than that? Yeah, they get a lot better. Number 9. The Rake so, Jeff the Killer was a simple feel-good story about a boy growing up and feeling frustrated. The rake, however, is out of this world, akin to something you might see in the SCP Foundation. What's the rake? Well, it's a kind of monster. A monster that's occasionally spotted and either causes a person to spoil their underwear or do quite the opposite. The other reaction is closer to how a person might greet a puppy dog. Documents that refer to this monstrous being date back to the 12th century. This is one document from 1880 translated from Spanish. I have experienced the greatest terror. I see his eyes when I close mine. They are hollow, black. They saw me and pierced me. His wet hand. I will not sleep. His voice. Unintelligible text. This is from 1691. He came to me in my sleep. From the foot of my bed I felt the sensation. He took everything. We must return to England. We shall not return here again at the request of the rake. Who is the rake? Some kind of succubus, incubus, an SCP? That's for you to find out. The rake is well written and interesting. It also led to numerous theories regarding what it is. Number 8. Anora Petrova This one might not be the most horrific of stories, but the concept is great. Hats off to the writer that came up with it. Basically, a young person is bored at home and decides to Google herself. You can only imagine how surprised she is to find a Wikipedia page dedicated to her. She's not famous, by the way, so that's why it's weird. That page contained all her personal information, her age, where she grew up, etc. It also talked about her love of ice skating. At first she was like, Dad, did you do that to impress me? And he said, no. She should have known that it's not all that easy to create a new Wikipedia page. Anyhow, she then creates her own account and tries to edit the page, but then finds that the page is blank except these words. Anora Petrova is a selfish little bitch who is going to get what she deserves. Excuse the language, don't shoot the messenger. She ends up losing a lot of friends for this and other things. And then, after a series of snubs in school, she finds the page has changed to this. Anora Petrova is a pathetic little orphan. Two years pass and she doesn't get any more popular. She's so unpopular, in fact, that she moved to Switzerland. Still, you can't hide from the internet. She looked at her wiki page there and it said Anora Petrova died friendless and alone. It also stated her death date for the first time. We know all this because she wrote it in an email sent to one of her remaining friends. The last thing she says is that she's locked in a room in unfriendly Switzerland waiting for her death date to pass. You could call this an internet parable about cyberbullying and how being hyperconnected isn't always a great thing. Number 7. No End House Who doesn't love a good haunted house story? This one we think is the best on the creepypasta wiki. Basically, a heroin junkie convinces his buddy to try and win 500 bucks by agreeing to walk every level of a haunted house. Ok, we know that sounds a lot like the very real McCamey Manor in the US, but people don't really get hurt here. Not a lot of people anyway. What happens next is part psychological horror likely written by someone who likes to smoke a lot of weed, and part McCamey Manor style horror. It all gets very weird from there. With the rooms of the house sounding like the days of Sodom from the Marquis de Sade's seminal book on torture. Yes, sadistic? That word comes from the author's name. Suffice to say the last room is the worst. We won't spoil it for you. Number 6. Robert the Doll There is actually a doll called Robert. It's real. This story is not entirely fiction. Robert the Doll is a sailor with an ugly head that looks a bit like a potato. The story revolves around a kid who was named Robert Eugene Otto. He receives the doll as a child and he names it after himself. He loved Robert the doll, but it seems that the doll wasn't all that keen on his owner. After a while, he started playing tricks on the kid. Sometimes his parents would hear two voices when Robert was in the room with the doll. Sometimes he'd scream in the night only for his parents to go into his room and find a sleeping child near his doll. 
all the furniture in the room would be overturned. This kind of thing went on for a while, and although Robert's parents didn't believe in sentient straw dolls, Robert the doll was retired to the loft, better safe than sorry. But then Robert grew up and he inherited the house. We won't tell you what happened to Robert and his wife after the doll was introduced again to the lower floors, but we'll say that things went a little crazy. We like this one because the house and the doll are real. You can go visit them today. Number 5. Doors In this story, we learn right away that the narrator is adopted. He talks about his adoptive family, the loving mother, the strict but decent father, a sister who he's protective of. In the first part of the story, everything seems pretty much normal apart from a few family quirks. It then goes into hyperdrive and a lot of blood is spilled at the hands of a madman. We really can't tell you much more, otherwise we'd spoil the shock ending. That's why we like this story. We just didn't expect this particular ending. Number 4. The Bad Dream some stories on the creepypasta are what you might call short and sweet. So much so that this one is over before you can picture what something would look like wearing your mother's skin. You'll know what we're talking about once you read it, but don't go yet. We've saved the best until last. Number 3. Psychosis What could be scarier than losing your mind? Have you ever been paranoid before? Have you ever thought everyone was out to get you? Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. It's not the knowing that's scary. Just because you're paranoid, it doesn't mean they're not after you. And that's how this tale goes. It's about a young man that lives alone and is afraid to go out in the outside world. He has contact with people, but not so often, and only in the form of electronic communications. His isolation begins to bother him. The phone rings and it's a wrong number, but is it? Outside, it's dark and gray and foreboding, which kind of mirrors what it's like inside his head. He tries to go outside, but never seems to make it any further than the hallway. Whenever he looks through the window, all he sees are dark clouds and rain. The tension keeps building, making the story one of the best creepypasta noir tales. We won't spoil it for you, but what we will tell you is that this man's diary starts to sound very, very weird. Number 2. Slender Man This faceless ghoul is known as the Slender Man, and it hunts the young folks that are obsessed with it. It has long arms and is seen wearing a smart suit. And if you get too near this thing, what'll likely happen is you'll end up looking like someone has jammed pencils in your ears and thrown boiling water over you. Be careful, because one day you might see it slip by the window looking like a shadow, but with the strength to kill. The story literally came to life in 2014 when two 12-year-old girls from Wisconsin were playing hide-and-seek with a third girl. They lured the girl into a wood, whereupon they stabbed her 19 times. She survived, but only just. Just before the attack, one of the girls said to the victim, Don't be afraid, I'm only a little kitty cat. They then proceeded to stab her in the arms, legs, stomach, liver, and pancreas. The victim shouted out through the pain, I hate you, I trusted you. When the cops interviewed the girls and asked why they'd done such a thing, they both said they did it for the Slender Man. It was kind of a blood sacrifice, something to appease the monster. They believed that if they killed the girl, they would be protected by it and would be able to live with it as servants in the forest. That didn't happen. Instead, they were charged with attempted murder in the first degree and sent to a juvenile detention facility. That's a testament to the hold this story has on some people. And that's why it's number two. Number one, the Russian sleep experiment. But our favorite creepypasta story is the Russian sleep experiment. Like many stories on the wiki, it's easy to believe that it's true. It isn't, but it's convincing enough. As the story goes, the Soviets were covertly experimenting on people back in the 1940s. That's believable because, hey, which superpower back then wasn't doing terrible things in the name of science and war? This experiment was simple enough. Soldiers in the field needed to stay awake for longer periods of time. So the Soviets were testing a kind of stimulation gas that was sprayed into a containment chamber. The test subjects were prisoners who were falsely promised that they'd be let go if they completed the 30-day experiment. What happens next is nothing short of horrendous. In short, screaming leads to self-harm. Self-harm leads to test subjects tearing out their own organs. That leads to test subjects engorging themselves on said organs. It's pretty disgusting and brilliant and it gets crazier. Did it really happen? In all your time working for the Foundation, you never thought this day would come. Panic hits you in an instant. If you weren't so horrified, then you might think about running for your life. But deep down you know that this would be futile. You'd hoped prayed even, that you'd never hear those fateful words yelled over your walkie-talkie. SCP-682 has breached containment. Of course, everyone working for the Foundation knows what SCP-682 is, the hard-to-destroy reptile, known for being fiercely aggressive, highly adaptive to all forms of damage, and coldly intelligent. You look down at the handgun in your shaking hand, your palm hot and clammy around the grip. 
and might as well be a super soaker. You already know that conventional weapons won't even pierce SCP-682's skin. It's just too powerful. A voice in the back of your head is reminding you that everything the Foundation has ever hurled at this enormous, vicious creature has already failed to do anything but temporarily slow it down. Even the most complex methods of destruction haven't been enough to put SCP-682 down permanently, only causing massive physical damage, but even that's not enough to stop its relentless nature. You realize your options couldn't possibly be more limited. Attempting to fight the hard-to-destroy reptile would only spell a grisly death for you. But of course, if you were to run, the Foundation would never forgive you for abandoning your post. You can't kill the beast, so your only hope is to find some way to get it back into containment. But how? You would be forgiven for first thinking that, as a reptile, SCP-682 would be susceptible to extremes in temperatures. Maybe some method of creating searing heat or freezing cold might stand a chance of beating it, even just for long enough to re-establish containment. But you'd be wrong. During one experiment, Foundation staff poured a single ton of liquid nitrogen onto SCP-682, hoping to freeze the beast solid, a plan that worked for 10 minutes. The reptile started generating massive amounts of heat, fully thawing its frozen body and continuing to increase its body temperature until the walls of its containment chamber started melting. You could try to recreate this, of course, but even if you could freeze the reptile, you'd only buy yourself 10 minutes, followed by a very angry SCP-682 letting off enough heat to potentially burn down the entire facility around you. So if freezing won't work, what about heating it up? A different test exposed the beast to extreme heat, but this also yielded similar results. Heating a chamber containing 682 to a high Kelvin, researchers witnessed the reptile form a shell of solid helium in order to protect itself. With fear still coursing through you, you begrudgingly accept that 682 could easily shrug off any method you alone could employ to try to recapture it. Any traditional weapon you could get your hands on would be little more than a pea shooter against 682. So what else could you possibly use to get the monster back into its cage? Then it hits you. Your gun might be useless, but there's an arsenal of other weapons at your disposal that could maybe, just maybe, give you enough of an edge against the creature. What is this wonderful weapon? One of the other SCPs. With a threat as big and ruthless and adaptable as SCP-682, perhaps trying to fight fire with fire isn't your best option. Given the reptile's regenerative capabilities and innate ability to adapt to any form of damage, it makes sense that the hard-to-destroy reptile has both the nickname and the reputation it does, unleashing another powerful SCP in the hopes that it'll cause enough damage to the reptile that it'll retreat back to its containment unit, or at least render it weak enough for Foundation security to restrain and recapture it, seems like a pipe dream. Maybe rather than deal damage to SCP-682, a better strategy would be trying to find some way of subduing the beast, slowing it down or maybe even making it susceptible to commands. That thought reminds you of SCP-061 and the effect it had on 682, and for a moment gives you hope that you might be able to win against the hard-to-destroy reptile. 061 is a music program. Copies of its source code are found on four separate CD-ROMs located in four different lockers. That certainly works in your favor. If one was to break, you'd still have three spares. The primary function of 061 is to control brain functions by tricking a subject's brain into a sleep state, preventing any and all thoughts, leaving the body suggestible enough to follow commands. When 682 was exposed to the 061 program, the creature entered the usual state of relaxation that other subjects experienced and even responded to basic commands like lie down and roll onto your back after a brief period of unresponsiveness. Although its movements were sluggish, almost reluctant, 682 did for a brief moment respond positively to the commands it was given. Unfortunately, after undergoing what appeared to be some form of seizure, SCP-682 rejected any further instructions and emitted a high-pitched screeching noise, causing nearby Foundation research staff to suffer the relaxed state one experiences after exposure to SCP-061. <laughs> These personnel were consumed by the reptile shortly after, and it remains unknown how the creature integrated the SCP-061 program into its biology. Assuming you found some way to utilize the SCP-061 program, which would likely violate the program's own containment procedures, then the chances of it being effective against SCP-682 are slim. Sure, you might get a few short moments of obedience out of the creature, but you would not be able to subdue it long enough to convince the reptile to return to the vat of acid it's normally oh. contained in. 
perhaps introducing an SCP that 682 has at least behaved passively around might be better. Then you remember the experiment with SCP-053, a strange little girl who has a profound effect on those who come into close contact with her. Any who touch 053 or spend in excess of 10 minutes around her are filled with a violent anger and an overwhelming compulsion to murder anyone nearby. While normally it would seem cruel to offer up what looks like a three-year-old child to a hateful, vicious reptile, you have no reservations about doing so with SCP-053. Luckily, she can regenerate, and any who try to kill her suffer a massive instantaneous heart attack, undoubtedly a perfect defense mechanism when faced with a creature that normally attacks anything in its path. When first introduced to SCP-682, the little girl was understandably afraid of the creature. Although the reptile did not devour the girl as it had done when presented with ordinary human children, instead, 682 lowered its head and invited 053 to come pat it. As she did, the creature exhaled through its nostrils, causing the girl to clap her hands in excitement and hug the creature by the head. For the remainder of the experiment, 682 remained docile as 053 brought toys and other items to the reptile, and even made drawings with crayons on the creature's carapace. To this day, the encounter is one of the only instances where 682, who usually despises all forms of life, has not been aggressive toward another living creature. Now, that sounds like a viable solution, right? Calm down the reptile with the little girl and while it's not looking, figure out a way to recapture it. Sounds easy enough. Well, assuming you can get SCP-053 from her containment unit to the reptile without succumbing to the murderous rage she infects people with, there's still the problem of what happens if you attempt to separate her from her reptile friend. During the original test, the Foundation staff who were supposed to contain the two SCPs were immediately torn apart by 682. This means even if you can get them together and pacify the reptile, you might still struggle to get it back to containment, as any attempt to capture the creature in a docile state would likely cost you your head, and probably a few limbs too. Plus, you can't rule out SCP-682 figuring out your plan to distract it using SCP-053. After all, the hard-to-destroy reptile is fiercely intelligent, and there's nothing stopping it from seeing through your plans and possibly even turning on SCP-053 in the process. And as much as you'd like to think it possible the heart attack 682 would suffer if it attempted to kill 053 would likely have little to no effect on the reptile. If all else fails, there might just be one SCP that could possibly slow 682 down long enough to get the reptile back into its acid bath cell. SCP-162, another SCP that the Foundation previously used in an experiment, designed to neutralize 682 permanently. While unsuccessful, 162 did manage to inflict severe bodily damage to the hard-to-destroy reptile, which might just be what you need to buy enough time to recapture the beast. 162 is a 7-foot-tall ball, a seething mass of sharp implements, ranging from fishing hooks and line to scissors and needles. Anyone in the vicinity of SCP-162 will find themselves drawn toward the razor-sharp mass, reaching their hands out, compelled to touch it. The longer someone's around SCP-162, the more they feel the themselves drawn to it, and when they touch it, they find hooks being embedded into the flesh of their hands, ensnaring and pulling them closer to cut them to ribbons. Previously, when these two SCPs have interacted, 162 dealt massive physical damage to 682, which, while not enough to kill it, could slow it down. During the experiment, SCP-682 became agitated in the presence of SCP-162, thrashing about and hurling profanities at the nearby Foundation staff. The reptile's lower body, head, and left forelimb quickly became entangled by the sharp mass, the creature writhing and letting out cries of pain. SCP-162 refused to release its grip on the reptile, and when the lizard attempted to detach itself from the ball of bladed implements, its lower jaw and left hind limb were wrenched clean of its body. Naturally, this angered 682 enough to breach containment, using SCP-162 to cause the deaths of 11 Foundation staff and a further 86 injuries. You'd have to be feeling pretty brave to unleash SCP-162 on the hard-to-destroy reptile, and of course brave isn't what you're feeling. You're afraid, and you hardly stand a chance at killing 682 with another SCP, let alone recontaining it. Then again, you never know, you might get lucky. Maybe 162 will entangle 682, ripping its limbs from its body and slicing its flesh into ribbons. Sure, the reptile will regenerate and reconstitute itself, but if luck is on your side, you might be able to just contain the beast before it was fully healed. Or you might just make it angrier and thus make the entire situation worse. Ultimately, as you already know, your options are more limited than they have ever been. 
run for cover, hide while your fellow Foundation personnel are slaughtered, or free one of the other SCPs and let it deal some damage to the hard to destroy reptile while hoping for the best. Whatever you're going to do, you better decide fast. Heavy crocodilian footsteps are drawing closer around the corner, and if you don't act fast and do something, then it's a guarantee that SCP-682 most certainly will. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault. She'd seen the closed sign on the front door of the toy shop. She'd been the one to try to scare him, claiming her toy was defective, demanding a replacement. Defective? His toy? Unbelievable. His toys were perfect. Masterpieces, sought out by young and old alike. They were works of art. And the nerve of that tiny little witch coming in here and claiming his toy was… he couldn't even bring himself to say the word. It was all her fault, really, and now, as usual, he was left to clean up the mess. Someone would come looking, though. There'd be a missed supper and angry parents gradually becoming more and more concerned as the hour became later and later, and eventually there'd be questions and investigations. Heaven forbid she actually told someone where she was going on her ridiculous mission to return a faulty toy. She'd have to go, but somewhere she wouldn't be found, not until he could find a more permanent means of disposal. Jason racked his brain, avoiding the accusatory stares of dozens of handcrafted puppets and dolls that adorned his shop. All of them were works of art, truly remarkable examples of the finest craftsmanship. Jason wasn't just the best toy maker in town, he was likely the best toy maker in Europe, probably in the whole world. And now you've gone and ruined all that for me. But there was no response from the corpse, just more slowly spreading crimson across the shop's floor. Then an idea struck him. He moved his unwanted guests to the workshop returning hastily to mop up the trail left behind. With the reaffirming tug on the front door's deadbolt, he retired to the workshop. There was a lot of grim work to be done, and the last thing Jason needed was another unwanted interruption. Days earlier, he'd been working on a large puppet in the shape of a snake. He had plans to adorn the puppet with colorful beadwork, which would make the toy snake scales sparkle in emerald greens in the sunlight. It would have been a thing of beauty, but now it would become a tool of necessity. The handsaw would make for quick, if macabre work and the remains would go inside the snake. An imperfect solution, but it only needed to be temporary. He cried at first, surprising himself even. It was truly grim work, and whatever small piece of him that wasn't yet angry at the world had opened a rather uncomfortable pit deep in his stomach. As he progressed, however, he began to fill the pit, stop it up with anger, resentment, indignation, and as he filled that pit inside him, he likewise filled the snake on his workbench. Just a few small cuts left then some turpentine to overpower the acrid smell of the blood, and any investigator searching his shop would be none the wiser. Once the search had died down, he could arrange for more permanent disposal. How did he get here, mused Jason, fouling what would have been one of his greatest masterpieces with his sin? Amelia. That's how. Toys were forbidden in his childhood home. Jason's parents believed frivolity was waste, especially when one could use that time to better prepare oneself for a successful future. If no homework were assigned at school, then rest assured, there would be much study waiting for him upon returning home. If homework was assigned, well, one couldn't receive too much instruction in subjects that would one day make Jason a great success. For his part, Jason earnestly tried his best to please his unpleasable parents. At school, he earned top marks in all his subjects. He may have well been very shy and had great difficulty socializing with the other children, but his behavior was ever exemplary. His parents often received notes of appreciation from his school teachers, to which his mother was fond of replying with, one shouldn't be congratulated for merely doing what is expected of them in civilized society. Children, no matter how strictly raised, are always prone to minor rebellions, and Jason was no different. His took the form of crafting and hiding small wooden dolls, which he'd used to play with when he could steal a few minutes away from under the ever-watchful and disapproving glare of his parents. He cherished those times, and as he grew older, his rough wooden dolls took ever more fanciful and skillful shapes. He realized he enjoyed creating them just as much as playing with them. They were his treasure, and he guarded them jealously. Sweet little Amelia. She'd always been so pleasant since the day Jason met her. Well, the truth is, Amelia had always sort of been there. He'd never made any effort to approach her, nor she him. Jason was, after all, the strange, silent, and very curious child who everyone knew secretly played with and spent hours whittling small dolls while the other children played together. In truth, it had actually been a concerned teacher who encouraged the two's formal introduction. Some kind soul had noticed Amelia's kind, warm heart, and taking pity on Jason's lonely plight, pushed her into befriending him. She hadn't been wrong, but her misguided act of kindness would help usher in yet another dark terror to this world. The two became fast friends, even helping socialize Jason more to his fellow classmates. He showed her, and only her, his secret doll collection, and other toys too. 
He even made some for her, all whittled away in secret, becoming ever more complex and detailed as the years passed and Jason's skill grew. Amelia was his best friend, and he wanted to share everything with her, but he refused to share her with anyone else. The first incident was with Jonathan, or was it Lucy on the swing set? Jason couldn't remember, but he did remember the intense hot flash of jealousy when Jonathan grew a little too interested in Amelia's set of colored pencils. He pushed him down the stairs, and Jonathan had even fingered Jason as the culprit. But Jason was good at remaining and acting unseen, and nobody could prove the accusation. Jonathan had gotten the message clear enough, however. Amelia and her colored pencils were off limits. The truth is, it was easy to remain unseen around Amelia, or at least unnoticed, which suited Jason's goals perfectly. She was always the brightest smile in any room, warmth like the radiance of a pleasant summer afternoon sun radiated from her, and she always had a kind word for everyone, much to Jason's chagrin. Jason finally had a friend, someone to confide in, but the truth is Amelia was a lonely girl, pretty and ever pleasant. Even as they grew older, she'd mysteriously been without any other close friends. As she entered her teenage years, there were certainly suitors, but they always seemed to quickly become disinterested. Jason, though, was always there, and she loved him as one does a dear brother. Jason, in turn, loved her as best he could, which was to say less than he loved himself, but certainly more than the mindless fools of the world. He expressed that love by protecting her even when she took no notice, especially from anyone who might take Amelia's attention and affections away. The world was dangerous and people can't be trusted, but Jason could be. Only him. Amelia had become especially important to him when he was kicked out of his home. His parents had insisted on his attendance to one of England's great universities, places where some of the age's great thinkers and titans of industries had been forged, but Jason had refused. He didn't want to become a coal baron or a great philosopher. He wanted to be left alone to tinker and make his toys. A simple toy maker carrying forth the family name? Nonsense. His father hadn't even wasted his breath on disapproving words, he merely pointed with a very stern finger to the open front door. But he'd done it all by himself. The world had taken notice of his talent, just as he knew it would, and his toy's popularities grew and grew until he finally had his own shop. And now children came from miles around, collectors too, looking for another finely handcrafted piece of whimsy for their carefully groomed collection. There was even rumors that toy makers from Austria were interested in meeting him. None of it mattered much to Jason. He already knew he was great, he didn't need the world to tell him. If anything, the crowds of dirty, noisy children and gawking collectors were a bothersome yet necessary distraction. They kept the coin flowing, but Jason would much rather have been left alone to work on his toys. All he needed was the daily visit from sweet Amelia, her approving nod or giggle at some fantastical new toy he created. If the rest of the world liked it, good for them. But Amelia changed. It had started with an argument. She'd come to visit him in his workshop after closing time as usual. You seem happy, Jason. He didn't even look up from his tinkering on the workbench. The puppet he worked on was still in its initial stages, but was already beginning to take on its serpent shape. Of course I am. Shop's closed and I can finally work in peace. I meant in general. I know your parents were really hard on you. I'm glad you found this. She motioned at the workshop around her, shelves stuffed with finished and unfinished toys. He continued his work nonplussed as usual. I wouldn't have gotten here without you. You were a good friend, always encouraging me. Though he didn't look up from his work, Amelia smiled. As far as Jason was concerned, this ranked amongst the greatest compliments he'd ever given her. That's why I've always been a good friend to you too, protected you. The smile wavered on Amelia's lips. What do you mean? Do you remember the pink letter? Amelia's ears still burned in shame at the memory, almost a full decade later. She'd been 15 back then and written a letter to a boy she developed a crush on. Lacking the courage to give it herself, she'd entrusted a close friend with it. Jason, sensing an opportunity to kill two birds with one stone, had acted instead. The letter wound up posted on the chalkboard of the boy in question's classroom. It's overly romantic and cringe-inducing amateur adorations read aloud by the boys of the class. They'd howled in laughter. But the name signed at the bottom of the letter hadn't been Amelia's, it had been her friend's. The jeers and taunts proved so great that her family had been forced to relocate her to a different school. I tried to teach you back then that you can't just open up to people like that. People can't see all the places you're weak, needy. You didn't learn your lesson, so I had to keep repeating it time and time again. Cold, hard realizations suddenly dawned across Amelia's face. All those friends who'd mysteriously drifted away, all those suitors who'd stopped calling on her. Did Jason really? How could you do that? Unconsciously, she was already inching toward the shop door. I protected you. I've always protected you. You had no idea what people are like, but you kept putting yourself out there like a silly little dolt. What was I supposed to do? Amelia had rushed out of the workshop then, tears streaming down her face. That persistent aching loneliness in her heart, always surrounded by people, yet none ever wanted to draw too close. Now it all made sense. Now she knew what or who had been keeping them away. A month had passed without Amelia's daily visits, and despite his pride, Jason began to doubt himself. Had he really done something wrong? 
Wasn't he just protecting Amelia, who clearly was incapable of protecting herself? More to the point, how could she be ignoring him? He'd worked so hard to make sure that he was the one always there for her. He'd put the toy snake and his brilliant emerald scales aside and begin working on something new. A gift. Something to prove to Amelia that he was sorry. Something so wonderful, so delightful that she'd have to see that he was the only person she could truly depend on. The small music box quickly took shape in his hands, elegantly and exquisitely designed as always, but different too. Even the most casual observer could quickly tell that this was truly shaping up to be one of Jason's finest pieces yet. He worked diligently day and night on the box and its many delicate gears and moving parts, pouring his very heart and soul into the labor. But the box would hold a surprise inside what would become without a doubt his finest piece to date, even more astonishing than the music box itself. A gift within a gift, an incredibly detailed handcrafted doll resembling Jason himself. Despite its miniature size, the doll bore a striking resemblance to Jason. Each lock of hair and minor bodily detail carefully etched onto the soft wood with painstaking care. Admiring his work, Jason began to fit the doll into its resting place inside the music box. He smiled thinking about how delighted Amelia would be upon receiving it. Surely everything would be forgotten the moment she received her wonderful gift only to open it and discover yet another gift inside. But what if she didn't? What if she remained angry at him or what if she didn't like it? What if his work wasn't good enough? What if she secretly thought Jason wasn't very talented at all? What if she threw the box on the ground in disgust, dashing it to pieces? Jason pushed the black cloud of thoughts away. No, of course she'd like it. She'd always liked his work. Everyone did. Amelia isn't interested in your friendship anymore, Jason. The words hit him like a sack of bricks. Amelia's mother stood on the doorstep to their small, modest home. Through the slightly open door behind her, Jason could see Amelia on the inside, tears in her eyes. That's… can I just talk to her please? I made her a present. Her mother had never cared for Jason. She remembered the canary incident. It had been a gift from her father, a small songbird that she quickly grew to adore. Then one day while Jason was visiting, the canary went abruptly silent. He claimed that the bird had suddenly gone limp and fell over dead. Amelia's mother always knew better but couldn't prove it. Now she barred Jason from entering her home, determined to end the parasitic grip he'd maintained on her life since they met his small children. Amelia, I made this for you, I'm sorry. Jason held the box aloft toward Amelia through the half-open door but she simply looked away. An icy cold hand gripped Jason's heart and he nearly dropped the delicate music box. Was this rejection? Jason didn't remember returning to his shop, tightly clutching the music box to his chest and desperately trying to avoid weeping on the open streets. He must have forgotten to lock the door behind him as he stormed into his shop because that's how the little girl found her way in. He hadn't meant to hurt anyone, but she'd been so demanding. She called his work flawed. She said it wasn't good enough. The sound of his name being called out broke him out of his reverie and he hastily put the finishing touches on the now overstuffed snake. Could someone be looking for the little girl already? Could someone know what he'd done? It took him a moment to recognize Amelia's voice. Damn it, he'd forgotten he'd given her a key long ago. He rushed out of the workshop, almost running into her as she passed through the back door behind the counter customers were not normally allowed to go to. I, I'm sorry to bother you, I just, I think we should talk. There's nothing to talk about. Whatever emotions Jason had been feeling, he'd stuffed and buried them. He'd done nothing but protect her, and now he regretted that she'd seen him in his moment of weakness. No, Jason, you've, uh, you've done things in my life that… Amelia paused, smelling the air. The strong smell of turpentine rolled off Jason in waves, but underneath, something else. Something she'd often smelled at the butcher shop. Jason, why are you sweating so hard? Jason's shoulders slumped. There was an accident with the little girl. I'd just gotten back from trying to give you my gift and say I'm sorry and I left the door unlocked, I guessed, and she barged in here complaining her toy was defective and demanding a replacement and saying my toys were no good and just, I'm not sure what happened, she fell, hit her head. Amelia's eyes slowly widened. Jason, what did you do? I, I didn't want to go to jail. It was an accident, Amelia, but I didn't want to go to jail. Jason, what did you do? Where is she now? Her voice was barely a whisper, as if she was afraid to even ask the question, or of the answer. I cut her up, put her in a puppet, until people stop looking, then I'll, I'll, give her, I'll give her a good burial. I just don't want to go to jail. It was an accident, Amelia. Jason, you have to turn yourself in. You have to explain what happened. Are you crazy? Do you have any idea what they'll do to me? I'll lose my shop. I won't be able to make toys anymore. They'll throw me in a cell to rot alone. Amelia had already begun to inch back toward the front door and away from Jason. If you don't turn yourself in, I will. Jason laughed, a harsh grating sound. Amelia had never seen him like this before, but strangely she wasn't surprised. It was as if some part of her had always known what he was capable of, what lay lurking just below the surface. It was the part of her that made her reach out for the nearby screwdriver. 
You think you have the nerve to turn me in? You've always been weak, Amelia. You've always needed people. That's why I always protected you, tried to make you strong, stand on your own two feet, and not need attention from everyone all the time. You're weak. I'm the only thing that ever made you strong. Amelia ran for the front door, but Jason reached out for her, snatching her by the hair and dragging her back. She spun on her heel and, acting purely on instinct, lashed out with a screwdriver, plunging it deep into Jason's chest. Jason froze, staggering on his feet. A growing look of disbelief blossomed on his face as he slowly stared out at the long metal tool sticking out of his chest. She had driven it deep, breaking past the rib bones and plunging it straight through his heart. Amelia stared in horror as Jason staggered a moment more and then flailed wildly as he fell, knocking over the items on the small counter to the floor. As he dropped to his knees, the music box crashed to the floor, breaking open and sending the small wooden doll with the carefully detailed likeness of Jason sliding across the floor. Amelia stared down at the doll in horror. It really did perfectly resemble Jason. It was without a doubt his finest work to date, but even more shockingly, she realized the doll was bleeding from the exact same spot in the chest she'd stabbed the real Jason. With a cruel sneer, Jason pulled the long screwdriver out of his heart, tossing it to the floor as he stood on his feet again. The wooden doll stopped bleeding, and Jason's real wound too began to close up and heal right before Amelia's shocked eyes. Amelia took a terrified step backwards as Jason stepped forward and picked up the broken music box and wooden doll, carefully putting the box back together and securely hiding the doll inside. I told you, you have to protect yourself. You can't let anyone know your vulnerabilities, your weaknesses. You have to hide them, keep them away from people. Not unless they've proven they deserve to be that close and can you let them know. Unless they've proven they love you more than anything. He held the sealed music box before Amelia. Only when you know that you're the most important thing in the world to them can you trust. Only then. This was supposed to be a gift. The greatest gift I could ever give anyone. But now I see you're not worthy. Jason stepped toward Amelia, forcing her back toward one of the toy shelves. But don't worry. I'll find someone who is. I'll find someone who actually cares about me and appreciates everything I do for her. Nobody will ever love a monster like you. Amelia backed up again but was stopped by the shelf behind her. Had Jason always been carrying the bloody hacksaw that was now in his hand? Amelia couldn't remember. A man sits at his desk writing a journal entry on a notepad. He's a programmer, but he doesn't trust his computer. He needs to make sure he can write his thoughts down in a place where nobody can mess with his words. Not that anyone's been doing that, he thinks. Nah, that'd be crazy. It just helps to have them physically written down, helps him focus and think. Plus, memory can play tricks on you. Best to write things down to remember them correctly. His apartment is so small, the walls are closing in. Maybe that's the reason for his funk lately. He should have paid a little extra for a nicer place, but saving money on rent was a powerful lure. Now he's stuck in one of the tiny apartments in the basement of his building. It doesn't help there's no windows to tell day from night, only the clock on the bottom right of his computer. He's a programmer, so he works from home a lot and keeps strange hours. His only clue that the sun has risen or fallen comes from that tiny clock at the bottom right of his screen. He's working on a big project. Pressure just to get it done is intense, but just sitting and typing for hours and hours on end can play tricks on your brain. But he just can't shake the feeling that that's not really it. He can't even remember when he started to feel like things were just a little off. Or how. Lack of human contact isn't helping and none of his friends seem to have been online in days to chat over Messenger. One of his few actual friends promised he'd call when he got back from the store… yesterday? Yeah, yesterday. But he never called. Or maybe he didn't get the call. Cell reception is terrible in the basement. Maybe he just needs to talk to someone or at least just get outside. He doesn't bother shaving before going out. Two-day growth still on his face. At least he had changed his shirt though, discarding that ratty one he'd been wearing for who knows how long. With it being lunchtime outside, he figured he'd run into at least one friend. Inexplicable fear as he opens his cramped apartment door. Almost like a tinge of agoraphobia. But where did that come from? Maybe it's just from being cooped up and not talking to anyone for so long. Waiting for him outside his apartment is a dreary hallway at the end of which is a huge steel door leading to the furnace room. There's two soda machines down there, but the first and only time he used one, the soda was two years expired. He leaves his apartment, closing the door softly and walking in the opposite direction. Why did he do that though? Why is he moving so quietly? He turns it into a game, moving silently so as to not break the steady hum of the soda machines. But as he gets upstairs into the front door of his building, he's in for a real shock. It wasn't lunchtime. It was dark outside, and it was late. He could tell by the silence of the street outside. The special kind of quiet where you can hear the wind blow sends shivers down his spine and he chalks it up to his body imagining the touch of the chill wind. Yeah, it's comforting to think that that's all it is. 
It doesn't feel right to go outside, so instead he lifts his cell phone up to the window and checks his bars. Presto, full bars. Now he could finally hear someone else's voice. He's so giddy with excitement he forgets his previous fears. Pressing the speed dial, he puts the phone to his ear, expecting to hear his best friend Amy's voice. But after one ring, the phone goes silent. Confused, he holds the phone to his ear for 20 seconds, then the phone finally hangs up. As he goes to dial her number again, his phone suddenly vibrates with an incoming call, startling him so hard he nearly drops it. Hello? The sound of his own voice startles him. He hadn't realized just how long it had been since he'd heard a human voice, or even his own. Hey, who's this? The caller sounds about his age, young and male. John, he replies. Oh, sorry, wrong number. Then a click and the line went dead. When the world just happened? He leans back against the brick wall and pulls up the recent call list, the number completely unfamiliar. Then he jumps out of his skin as the phone vibrates in his hand again. He presses the talk button and says nothing. John? Waves of relief wash over him. It's Amy's voice. Hey, it's you. Who else would it be? Oh, the number. I'm at a party on 7th Street. My phone died, just as you called me. This is someone else's phone. Oh, okay. Where are you? His eyes glance around at the drab, whitewashed walls and heavy metal door with a small window looking outside. At my place, just feeling cooped up, didn't realize it was so late. You should come over. Nah, I don't feel like looking for some strange place by myself in the middle of the night. I think I'm just going to keep working or go to bed. He didn't want to admit that the real reason was the way the deathly silent streets outside scared him a bit. Nonsense, I can come get you. Your building's close by, isn't it? How drunk are you? You know where I live. Oh, good point. I guess I couldn't walk over. Not unless you want to waste half an hour. Right, all right, well, I gotta go. Good luck with your work. He watches the numbers flash once as the call ends, and then the droning silence of the old apartment building washes over him again. The two strange calls and eerie quiet outside only make him feel that much more alone. Then a terrifying thought hits him, maybe born of too many scary movies, maybe of real fear. What if some horrible monster peered into that small window set into the steel exterior door right now, spawning him? Some nightmarish creature that preyed on those who strayed too far from other living people. The thought alone was enough to cause him to rush back home, closing the door as swiftly and silently behind him as he could. He felt a little silly, safe inside his apartment once more, but the fear had been real and inexplicable. Why did Amy sound off during that conversation? Could it have been the alcohol? Could it? Ah, oh, that's why he was writing these experiences down. It helped him remember. She said she'd been at the party, but there was no background noise at all. Maybe she'd stepped outside. No, because then he'd be able to hear the wind. Or should he? He needed to see if the wind was still blowing outside. Monday. He's writing his thoughts down on paper again. He had no idea what he'd expect to see when he ran back up the stairwell last night, peering out the window. It all seemed ridiculous now, especially since last night's fear seemed so distant and unreasonable. He can't wait to go out into the sunlight. He's going to check his email, shave, shower, and get out of that dingy, cramped apartment. But wait, what was that? That noise? Thunder? There'd be no sunlight and fresh air today. Going up the stairwell revealed only disappointment as he peered out the tiny window on the heavy metal door, seeing rain slamming into it. A small amount of dim, gloomy light shone through the window, but it was enough to tell him it was day. A very rainy, blustery, wet day. He pressed his face up against the window, hoping to see outside better as the lightning flashed. But the rain's too heavy, and he can only see vague shapes moving at odd angles through the waves of water that washed down the window. He turned around, but instead of going home, he got the urge to climb the stairs. The third floor was the tallest floor of the building, and here he stops. The outer wall of the stairwell had thick glass that warped with age, scattering the light and making visibility pretty much zero. He enters the third floor itself, walking by the closed apartment doors. They'd been painted blue once, but like everything else in the building, the color had faded long ago. It was silent, only the sound of the rainstorm outside. But it was the middle of the day, so he wasn't surprised nobody was home. He couldn't shake the idea that the doors were like weathered granite monoliths erected by some ancient forgotten civilization for some unfathomable purpose. Then the lightning flashes and for just a moment he could have sworn that the faded blue wood looked exactly like rough stone. He laughs at himself for letting his imagination run away with him. Then he remembers the alcove with the inset window halfway down that floor's hallway. He runs to the window eager to see a human being in the world outside, but as he goes to lift the window and peer out of it, a sudden terrifying fear hits him. If he opened that window, he would see something terrifying on the other side of it. But what? He has no idea, but it's enough to make him back off the window. And that's when he returns to write his experience down. Done. He came up with a plan. He was going to get his webcam. The cord wasn't long enough to go all the way up to the third floor, but he could use it to surveil his own floor. He'd stick it between the two soda machines and hide the wire with black tape. 
camouflaging it against the black plastic strip that runs along the base of the hallway's walls. Seemed silly, but he's really got nothing better to do. But nothing happened. He propped open the hallway to stairwell door and flung the heavy front door wide open, running like hell back down to his room. He watched the webcam to see if something terrible was pursuing him, but there was nothing. He wished the camera's position was different so he could actually see out of the front door, but hey, somebody's online. He got out an old webcam and set it up so he could video chat. He didn't explain to his friend why he wanted to video chat, and the two shared a mostly empty conversation, but damn, it felt good to see another person's face again. That gnawing fear that had been plaguing him lately had mostly passed, but later the thought hit him. There was something odd about the conversation. His friend seemed to be very vague in his responses. He couldn't even recall one specific thing his friend had said, but he did ask for his email address to keep in touch and, oh, there's an email now. It's Amy. She asked for him to meet for dinner where they usually go, a pizza joint. He's getting dressed and the thought of delicious pizza is a good motivator. All he's been eating lately is whatever random foods in his fridge. He's ready to leave when there's another email. He opens the email and scans it. It's from an old friend and it's been sent to every person in that friend's address book. It reads simply, seen with your own eyes, don't trust them. What the hell is that supposed to mean? The words shock him and he goes over them again and again in his mind. It seems like a desperate unfinished email, as if it just been sent before something happened. He was ready to disregard the email as just spam or a computer virus or something, but those words kept ringing in his head. Seen with your own eyes. He reads back over his journal and can't help but think how for the last few days he hasn't seen another person with his own eyes or talked to someone face to face. The strange video chat with his friend, the random wrong number, the oddly silent return call from Amy claiming she was at a party, and the friend then asked for his email address and then got an email just a few minutes later. And then the fear grips him. He told Amy over the phone that he was just half hour's walk from 7th Street. They know he's near where she called from. What if they're trying to find him? Where in the world is everyone else? And why hasn't he seen or heard anyone else in days? This is insane, he thinks. He needs to calm down. He paces his apartment furiously, waving his cell phone around to see if he can get a single bar of signal through the thick concrete walls. Finally, near one ceiling corner in his tiny little bathroom, he gets it, one bar. He sends a text to every number on his phone. You seen anyone face to face lately? He keeps the message short and cryptic so as to not betray his fear. He just wants a response, even if it's someone telling him he's crazy. He tries to call, but if he brings the phone down out of the corner to his mouth, he loses all his service. And that's when he remembers the computer and rushes over. He sends an instant message to everyone on his contact list that's online. Nobody responds. His messages grow more and more frantic. He tells everyone that he's home. He invites them over, asks them to stop by and see him for any number of reasons. He just needs to see someone's face. Then he tears his apartment apart, looking frantically for some other way to contact another human being, but without opening the door and going outside. He knows it's crazy, but what if there is real danger out there? He needs to be sure it's safe out there, and he needs a reply, so he tapes his phone to the corner of the ceiling where it gets its one lonely bar of reception. Tuesday. The phone actually rang. He must have fallen asleep, exhausted from last night's rampage. He wakes up to the phone ringing and rushes to the bathroom. It's Amy. She's really worried about him and has been trying to contact him since the last time they talked. She's coming over, and yes, she knows where he lives. He's mortified at his behavior lately. He wants to destroy the journal, so nobody knows how crazy he's been lately. Also, he looks terrible. His eyes have sunken in and stubble's growing thick and dark. His apartment is also trashed, but he needs Amy to see what he's been through, so he's not going to clean it up. But he's not crazy, he's just the victim of extreme probability. He just happened to leave his apartment when nobody else was around, that's all. It's a reassuring thought made better by his rediscovery of the television in his closet. He sets it up and lets it drone on in the background. A nice reminder that there is a world out there past his concrete walls. He's glad that Amy is the one who responded to him. She's been his best friend for years and she has no clue, but he counts the day he met her as one of the happiest in his life. He can still go back to that warm summer day on the playground. It felt like they sat and talked for days. They were grown by then, far too old to play, but they hung out and just chatted together. It's a warm memory and it helps him escape the dingy reality of his basement apartment and all the haunting thoughts that come with it. A knock at the door. It wouldn't be until later that he would find it odd that he didn't see her through the camera he'd hidden between the soda machines. He figured it was probably just bad positioning, but he should have known. He yelled at the door, jokingly, that he had a camera between the soda machines and he'd watched Amy walk over to the camera and bend over, smiling and waving. Hey, I know it's weird. I've had a few weird days. He talks into the mic attached to the computer. Must have. Open the door, John. But he hesitates. How could he be sure it was really her? 
Hey, uh, humor me for a second. Tell me one thing about us. Just prove that it's really you. She gives the camera a weird look. Um, alright. We met randomly at a playground when we were both way too old to be there. He sighs. The fear fades. This was so ridiculous. Of course it was Amy. He never told anyone how he met Amy. Nobody but the real her could know how they met. <laughs> alright, I'll, I'll explain everything. Be right there. He rushes to the bathroom and makes himself as presentable as possible. He looked terrible, but Amy would understand in that special way best friends do. He snickers at his own behavior and the mess he's made of his place, tearing it apart looking for… what? He couldn't even remember. The trash was overflowing and the bed had been tipped all the way over on its side in a desperate search for who knows what. As he turns to the door and goes to open it, his eyes fall on the old webcam, the one he'd used to video chat with his friend. It was lying haphazardly tossed on its side, the lens pointed straight at the table with his open journal. Terror grips him. He'd asked Amy to prove it was really her and she told him the one thing nobody could have possibly known but them unless someone on the other side of the webcam had watched him write it into his journal just now. He screams in terror and rushes to the webcam, snatching it and stomping it on the floor. The door shakes, the doorknob turns, but he can't hear Amy's voice through the door. Was the basement door too thick? Or was Amy not even outside and something else was trying to get in? He saw her through the webcam outside, heard her through his speakers, but how could he know she was really real? He screams and shouts for help as he piles furniture up against the door. Friday. Or at least he thinks it's Friday. He's broken everything electronic. All that's left is the journal that he writes into and the computer smashed to pieces. Anything that anyone could hack into and snoop on him is destroyed. He goes over the last week in his mind time and again. Everything anyone has said to him via phone or email or Amy through the door, it was all info he'd already written or given out himself. He'd got nothing new back. It was as if something was trying to trick him to get outside. All the way back at the start, Amy on the phone, she was basically asking him to open the door and go outside with her. He runs the possibilities through his mind. His logical side says it's just simple, bad probability. He just happened to go outside when nobody was around. He just happened to get a random nonsense spam email by pure chance. But another voice tells him that there is something out there wanting to get him. Extreme convergence of probability is the only thing that's kept him alive. He never opened the window on the third floor. He never opened the front door, except for that stunt with the hidden camera when he rushed back to his apartment. He hasn't even opened his own front door since then. Whatever's out there, if anything at all, never appeared inside the building until he opened that front door. Maybe the reason he hasn't seen it in the building before is that it was busy getting everyone else until he stupidly betrayed his location by calling Amy, call that failed until he got a return call asking for his name. The terror is overwhelming. As his mind wrestles with the pieces of the puzzle, was that email random? Or was it cut off right before a horrible fate befell his friend? Was it a desperate warning? Seen with my own eyes, don't trust them. Why was it exactly what he'd been suspicious of? Did it have mastery over all electronics? It had to have a physical form and had actually knocked on his door when it took the form of Amy. Maybe this entity can't go through doors. His mind races back over all the books and movies he'd ever seen or read, trying to find an explanation. Could doors be some sort of ward against whatever this thing is? Maybe it's just not strong enough to bash through a heavy wooden door, let alone the thick steel door at the front entrance to the building. But why did it want him specifically? If it wanted to kill him, it could just wait until he starved to death. What if it doesn't want to kill him? What if it has something far more horrific in store? How can he escape this nightmare? A knock at the door. It's Amy, or at least her voice along with two policemen and a psychiatrist. His mind races, thinking through all the ways that the voices could be faked electronically. He wishes he hadn't destroyed his computer so he could look at them through the webcam. Why did it take three days for them to come for him? Maybe it took three days to come up with a scheme that would convince him to open the door. The psychiatrist is convincing, unless it's a clever ploy to get him to open the door. The psychiatrist has an older voice, strong and authoritarian, but caring, it's comforting. He's desperate to see another human being with his own eyes. The psychiatrist says he's suffering from something called cyberpsychosis, and he's just one of thousands of people nationwide who've broken down after being triggered by a suggestive email that quote, got through somehow. Got through somehow? He thinks that the psychiatrist means it spread through the country inexplicably, but what if this entity just slipped up and revealed a vital piece of information? He's suspicious, deeply suspicious. The psychiatrist claims he's part of a wave of emergent behavior, and a lot of other people are having the same problem. That would explain the strange email. He didn't get the original triggering email, just a watered down part of it that his mentally unstable friend had sent out, trying to warn everyone of his paranoid fears. 
The psychiatrist claimed that that's how the problem spread, and he could have spread it too with his random texts and an instant message to his entire address book. Some of those people could be breaking down right now, triggered by something he'd accidentally sent them, something their delusional mind could be interpreting in a way that powers their personal delusions. Like a text saying, seen anyone face to face lately? The psychiatrist says he doesn't want to lose anyone else. You're one of the smart ones. So smart, you make up connections that shouldn't be there. The psychiatrist says it's easy to get caught up in the paranoia, thanks to our fast-paced world. A place that's constantly changing and more and more of our interactions are simulated and online. It's a great explanation, perfect really. It explains literally everything and why should he stay locked up in this tiny apartment festering in his own delusions until he starves to death. All he needs to do to get better is just open the door and get help. It's a perfect explanation, and that's exactly why he refuses to open the door. How could he be sure what's real and what's not? Signals through a camera can be hijacked, emails and video faked. Even what he sees on TV right now lying broken on that floor, how can he know for sure any of it's real? It's all just signals and waves and bashing at the door. The entity's trying to get inside, it has to be. There's no way to fake the sound of men grunting and smashing against the heavy wooden door so realistically. It's coming in and it's going to get him, but at least he'll finally see the entity with his own eyes. There's no way left for it to deceive him. He's ripped apart every electronic device in his apartment. It can't deceive flesh and blood eyes, or can it? Seen with your own eyes, don't trust them. They… wait, what was that desperate message telling him? To only trust his eyes? Or warning that he couldn't trust them either? What even is the difference between a camera and eyes? They both turn light into electrical signals and they're the exact same. He can't be deceived, he has to be sure. He has to be sure. Date unknown. He's been calmly asking for paper and pen day in day out, until they finally give it to him. Not that it matters anymore. What's he going to do with a pen? Poke his eyes out? The bandages over his hollow sockets feel like a part of him now, and the pain has long ago faded. He works the pen over the paper, figuring it'll be his last chance to write legibly. Without his eyes to guide his hand, he'll soon forget the motions involved in writing. It's an indulgence, the writing, a relic from another time, because he's certain everyone in the world is dead or suffered a fate far worse. He sits against the padded wall of his room day in and day out. The entity brings him food and water. It masquerades as a kind of nurse, or an unsympathetic doctor. He suspects that the entity has figured out his hearing has sharpened considerably since he lost his vision, because he can hear it faking whispered conversations in the hallway outside, on the off chance he might hear. A nurse talks about having a baby soon. One of the doctors has lost his wife in an accident. None of it matters. None of it's real. None of it gets to him except her. The thing comes to him masquerading as Amy. Its recreation is perfect, it sounds and feels exactly like her, even produces a reasonable facsimile of her tears that he can feel on the lifelike cheeks. When it first dragged him here, it told him all the things that he wanted to hear, that it loved him, that it didn't understand why he'd done this, that they could still have a life together if he'd only stop insisting he was being deceived. It wanted, no, it needed him to believe she was real and he almost fell for it. He doubted himself for a long time. In the end though, it was all too perfect, too flawless, too real. The false Amy would come every day, then every week, then finally stopped coming altogether. But he knows the entity won't give up. The waiting game is just like another one of its gambits. He will resist the rest of his life if that's what it takes because he knows the entity needs him to fall for its deception. And maybe if he can resist, he can stop its agenda. Maybe the real Amy is still alive out there somewhere. It's his resistance that's stopping the entity and keeping him alive. He holds on to that hope as he rocks himself back and forth alone in his cell. He'll never give in. He'll never break. He's a hero. The doctor reads the note the patient scribbled on. It's barely legible, written in a shaky script of a man who can no longer see. He wanted to smile at the man's resolve, a reminder of the human will to survive, but he knew the patient was completely delusional. After all, a sane man would have fallen for the deception a long time ago. The doctor wanted to smile. He wanted to whisper words of encouragement to the delusional patient. He wanted to scream, but the nerve filaments that wrapped around his head and drove into his eyes prevented him from it. Instead, his body stood up rigidly like a puppet, and he walked into the patient's room once more to tell him once again that he was wrong. There was nobody trying to deceive him. The SCP Foundation The internet's favorite monster-battling secret organization. The Foundation works in the shadows to keep humanity safe from dangerous supernatural entities, cursed objects, 
and paranormal catastrophes. To make this possible, they develop state-of-the-art weapons and containment technology to make sure they always stay one step ahead of the threat. You're probably thinking it's a shame we don't have a group like this in real life, considering all the real problems and threats we're always facing. Thankfully, we do have a real-life answer to the SCP Foundation, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, the world-class research and development group that's given the US military some of its most powerful and sophisticated tech for the last 60 years. Today we're going to talk about what DARPA is and when and why it was founded, and most importantly of all, some of the most amazing, unbelievable, and downright awesome projects they've been involved in. DARPA was first created back in 1958. The Soviets had just launched the unmanned probe Sputnik into space, and people across the US were starting to feel nervous. President Dwight D. Eisenhower didn't intend to take Russia's leap into the stars lying down, so he authorized the creation of a group to put the United States back at the forefront of scientific and technological research and development. This group was first called the Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA, before the word defense was added to the title in 1972 presumably because Congress is always eager to throw more money at something with defense in the title. With the headquarters in Arlington, Virginia, DARPA has 220 government employees working in six different technical offices, with an annual budget of around $3.4 billion. The organization currently oversees over 250 state-of-the-art research and development projects. The purpose of DARPA is simple, making sure that the United States has the best defense technology in the world. Their organization selects project leaders promising individuals at the top of their field, with ideas that can reshape the world of national defense and security, and gives them the coordination and funding they need to make their ideas possible under the DARPA umbrella. The official mission statement of DARPA is to make pivotal investments in breakthrough technologies for national security, and they manage to achieve this goal and much, much more. Like a lot of military technology, projects first spearheaded by DARPA have influenced technologies that would later come into common civilian use. To name one particularly impressive example, DARPA military computer networks laid the groundwork for the modern internet. So you can thank DARPA for your ability to watch this video and learn about them. But we know that isn't why you're here. You want to know about the real moonshots, the kind of mind-blowing projects and technical advancements that really make DARPA seem like the real world's answer to the SCP Foundation. We have some truly incredible technology for you here, and rest assured each one is crazier than the last. First we have the Eater Project. Developed by Cyclone Power Technologies under the supervision of DARPA, EATER stands for Energy Autonomous Tactical Robot and refers to a type of theoretical surveillance robot that could feed on plants the way a human or animal does. Researchers believe that if a spy robot could eat independently to maintain its energy supply, it would be able to carry out missions far longer than both humans and conventional machines. It was believed that the finished machines would be able to travel 100 miles for every 150 pounds of biomass consumed. Incidentally, this is close to the weight of your average adult human. If ever Eater wanted to try something more meaty, in case you think we're being sensational here, even the CEO of Cyclone Power Technologies, Harry Scholl, released a statement saying, We completely understand the public's concern about futuristic robots feeding on the human population, but that's not our mission. How incredibly reassuring. But instead of evil robots spilling blood, let's think about something even crazier. DARPA making blood. That's right, DARPA is currently working on revolutionizing the concept of blood farming. This means reproducing red blood cells outside the body to create stocks of so-called synthetic blood for transfusion during surgery. As we currently sit in the middle of a blood and organ shortage for a long, long waiting list of desperate patients, DARPA's research into blood farming could change the game and save millions of lives every year. The amount of money the DARPA method saves is also staggering. With these new techniques, the cost of synthetic blood per unit is cut from $90,000 to a mere $5,000. Saving lives and money with futuristic synthetic blood? What's not to love? But if you think that's incredible, you haven't seen anything yet. Have you ever dreamed about having super strength or the ability to go further than you ever could before? Thanks to DARPA, this superhero fantasy can become a reality. Scientists created a device known as the Soft Exosuit, a kind of artificial exoskeleton worn by soldiers to supercharge their strength and endurance. Any troop or rescue worker can suddenly have the strength and the precision of a machine. 
making the classic trope of the super soldier a very real thing. The suit even has a microcomputer and built-in sensors that make it super adaptable to the needs of the user, meaning it can do the heavy lifting in more ways than one. The soft exosuit is just one more step in every self-respecting geek's quest to see the Iron Man suit become a reality in their lifetime. The technology to make you a god-tier weightlifter is one thing, but the tech to make you the world's greatest sharpshooter is another ballpark entirely. Spray and pray has long been the mantra of soldiers who aren't super confident at landing dead-on shots in a tricky situation, but DARPA's awesome and terrifying exacto ammunition could make this a thing of the past. These bullets are still in development and many of the details of their production are top secret, but it's believed exacto ammunition is fitted with built-in guidance systems that allow them to actively seek their targets after being fired. If snipers weren't scary enough already, the completion of exacto bullets might make them truly impossible to escape. Did that last one make you feel a little paranoid? We're sorry to report that that's nothing compared to the next creepy technological marvel from DARPA. Most people aren't exactly huge fans of bugs, and people working in intelligence across the globe have even more of a reason to hate them. DARPA has been developing the technology to turn insects into tiny weapons of espionage. For all you know, a fly in your room right now that you haven't even noticed could be feeding audio straight to the CIA. How is this possible, you might ask? A DARPA project known as the HIMEMS program has pioneered the tech necessary to implant a variety of different insects with tiny recording technology. Even scarier though, DARPA has discovered tech capable of manipulating the minds of insects with electrical pulses, making sure they end up in all sensitive areas of their intended target, watching you with their beady compound eyes. However, it's worth noting that insects have incredibly simple brains. Building a true interface between, say, a human brain and a digital technology would truly be an astonishing feat. So it comes as no surprise that of course DARPA has been working on that one too. In fact, DARPA hopes to create an implantable device that will allow for a precise connection between the human brain and the digital world as part of its Neural Engineering System Design Project or NEST. The end goal of this truly remarkable technology would be transforming the electrical and chemical signals of our brains into data readable by computers. It would allow for an unparalleled level of interpersonal connection and would mark the first time in human history that we could truly see the world through another person's eyes. But if we're talking about science fiction technology becoming reality, there's only one thing on most people's minds laser weaponry. From Star Wars to Halo, almost no futuristic setting is complete without some awesome laser weapons, and DARPA is bringing their own to the table. With the incredibly badass name Excalibur, it's no surprise that these lasers really bring the heat. DARPA's combat laser weapon designed to be fixed to planes for aerial combat is lighter, more efficient, and far more deadly than almost any laser we've ever seen before. Sometime in the future, if you're unlucky enough, they might even be vaporizing you. But what's a crazy futuristic weapon without an even crazier futuristic vehicle? Enter DARPA's Transformer Project. No, we're not kidding, it's actually called that. With this project, DARPA's mission is to create something that's as effective on land as it is in the air, a kind of flying car or tank that some have described as a more militarized Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. These vehicles will be able to fly in, land, and then continue their high-intensity missions on the ground with a truly unparalleled level of adaptability. They're even designed to fly 250 nautical miles on a single tank of fuel. Throw on a couple of Excalibur laser cannons, and you've got the coolest vehicle since the Millennium Falcon on your hands. However, while a lot of this technology is mind-blowingly cool, it's worth mentioning that active combat is no picnic. In addition to obvious death tolls and physical injuries, People involved in these kinds of combat engagements can often develop debilitating mental illnesses like post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. But DARPA is also developing new technology to help treat PTSD along with a number of other serious ailments like anxiety, depression, and substance abuse. It all comes down to a project known as Subnets which stands for the Systems-Based Neurotechnology for Emerging Therapies Project. While the exact science is still being developed, this piece of cutting-edge neurotechnology is a brain implant that treats neurological issues from within the skull. Because of the sensitivity of the issue, DARPA has brought a legion of psychology, neurology, and ethics experts to make sure everything goes smoothly. After all, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Throughout this video, we've discussed a huge number of technologies developed by DARPA that would make the SCP Foundation proud. They've regularly committed to turning science fiction into science fact over the last 60 solid years. And of course, no overview of some of DARPA's most iconic projects would be complete without a journey into their most iconic contributions to the world of robotics. 
On the more basic level, we have the transport and reconnaissance robots made possible by DARPA's coordination and funding. Two famous examples are the Wildcat and the Big Dog both created by robotics company Boston Dynamics. These four-legged robots were built to traverse dangerous terrain and haul military equipment. However, concerns about the volume of these robots made people doubt their viability in combat. But that doesn't mean they're useless. These robots are still being prepared today for use in dangerous environments and work in risky fields like mining and construction. The biggest debate still surrounding these quadrupedal machines is whether they're cute or creepy. The battle rages on. And finally, an incredible machine straight out of the realms of science fiction, Atlas, one of the most brilliant humanoid robots ever created. And of course, it was created by DARPA. This six-foot-tall beast of a machine was another collaboration with Boston Dynamics and has shown a strength and agility that prior androids have only ever dreamed of, between the electric sheep, we assume. But before you're too afraid, there are no plans to use Atlas in combat situations. Atlas is mainly intended for dangerous emergency situations like search and rescue missions into hostile terrain. So there you have it, an exploration into some of DARPA's most incredible projects, and these are just a fraction of the nearly 250 currently operating, so who knows what else DARPA is working on under the hood. They may not have monsters and anomaly entities to fight like the SCP Foundation, but we can rest pretty easily knowing that if it ever becomes a problem in the real world, DARPA has the skills, brains, and resources to know exactly what to do. Imagine being in total darkness. It's unfathomable. There always seems to be a source of light, no matter where you are. However, in the deep depths of a cave, someone can experience true darkness, a darkness so black that you can taste it. This is what Ted and his friend B found in Mystery Cave, a darkness and an evil that would change their lives forever. We're about to take you into one of the first creepypasta stories ever created on the internet. Creepypasta is the term for horror stories and legends that are shared on the internet. They're user-generated and tend to be created only to terrify or enthrall others. We're warning you now that this story will likely give you nightmares, and by the end you'll need to decide for yourself whether Ted the Caver's story is true or if there's something else going on. Ted the Caver is claimed by many to be one of the first creepypasta stories ever put in the internet. It all started with an Angel Fire website created by Ted where he chronicled his story of exploring a mysterious cave in journal format. Each journal entry pulls us deeper and deeper into his story and the horrors that were encountered while in the cave. December 30th, 2000. The journal begins. This was the first time Ted and B went to Mystery Cave together. B and Ted had been caving together for several months. B had injured himself in a caving accident a few years prior and was told by doctors he would never walk again. But B was strong and he didn't give up. He worked hard and was not only able to walk again but managed to recover enough to start exploring caves again. He would never be as fast as he once was, but he was able to do almost anything he put his mind to. Ted had explored Mystery Cave before and had come across a small hole at the end of one of the tunnels that appeared to lead to another chamber. This hole was interesting for several reasons. The first was that there seemed to be a constant stream of blowing air out of it. Ted wasn't sure why this was happening, but he thought if he could find a way to make the hole bigger and fit inside, he'd be able to decipher the mysterious source of the air. B and Ted anchored a rope to a thick tree outside the opening of the cave and threw it in. In order to enter the cave system, they needed to rappel into the maw of darkness. They carried backup lights with them along with glow sticks that could be used in emergency situations. After descending over the several ledges into the cave, Ted and B came to a crawl space where they needed to get on their hands and knees. The tunnel emptied out into a large room with four passageways. The two tunnels to the left both led to dead ends. The one second from the right led to a pool of stagnant water, while the tunnel on the far right terminated at the small hole Ted wanted to explore. When they reached the hole and began to examine it, they both agreed that it was possible that the tunnel on the other side opened up and connected to a virgin cave. This is what cavers call a chamber that's never been explored before. It's the holy grail of caving. Being the first person ever to step foot in a chamber or a tunnel system that's been sealed off for thousands or even millions of years is a spiritual experience. Both Ted and B hoped that if they were able to widen the hole enough, they could slip through and explore what lay beyond. Using his Kodak disposable camera, Ted took a picture of the hole with a glove in it for a size comparison and uploaded it to his website. There's no way that Ted and B could fit through the current hole unless they could make it larger. But when B saw it, he became as excited as Ted was. B and Ted brainstormed how to make the hole larger. It appeared that even once they got through the hole, the tight squeeze went back another 10 to 12 feet before it really opened up. This meant that they would need to slowly shimmy their way through the rock, squeezing in on them from all sides. This would not be a journey for anyone that was claustrophobic. 
As Ted and B discussed their plan of attack, the first creepy phenomenon occurred. The wind blowing through the hole continued to howl. It was an eerie noise that had no clear source. B held up his hand to indicate that Ted should stop talking and listen. Underneath the howling of the wind, a low rumbling sound could be heard. This new noise would only happen every now and then and was thought to be made by large trucks driving over the cave. The two cavers shrugged it off and continued discussing how they would open up the hole so they could fit through. They decided that by using a battery-powered drill along with bullpins and a sledgehammer, they could chip away at the sides of the hole and widen it. Before they left for the day, Ted named the passage Floyd's Tomb after Floyd Collins, who discovered parts of what would become Mammoth Cave National Park. Floyd had died from dehydration and exposure to hypothermia after being trapped in the cave system for 14 days when a cave-in occurred. This was just an ironic name given to the passage, but in the coming months, Floyd's tomb would be living up to its name. After leaving Mystery Cave, Ted went home and chronicled what he and B had found and what their plan was going to be. He created a crude drawing of Floyd's tomb so that other cavers had a clearer idea of what the system looked like. January 27th and 28, 2001 About a month had passed before Ted and B returned to Mystery Cave with the tools they needed to start enlarging the hole to Floyd's tomb. Carrying the heavy equipment down into the cave was tedious, and working in the cramped conditions to chisel away at the sides of the hole was difficult. The two men had to remain crouched, and only one person could work at a time, due to limited space. As one person worked, the other would rest in the darkness, contemplating what awaited them on the other side of the hole. They used the cordless drill to slowly scrape away the rock along the sides of the hole, along with a chisel and a five-pound sledgehammer to remove larger chunks of rock. It was slow going and a lot of work, but the men were determined to get through. After some time, their first drill battery died. In the silence, they could hear the wind howling through the hole. It seemed to be blowing stronger than the last time. But it was the low rumbling sound that they couldn't explain. This noise was also getting louder, which didn't make sense if it was only trucks passing overhead. It was as if something deep inside the cave was getting closer, but this terrifying thought was pushed to the back of their minds. After their second drill battery died, Ted and B had to call it a day. They packed up and ascended to the surface. To make their lives easier, they left some equipment in a large crack in the cave so they wouldn't have to carry it all back down into the hole in the future. They slept in a hotel that night and woke up late from the exhaustion that accompanied the drilling and hammering of the day before. Once they were both awake, they had something to eat and headed back to Mystery Cave to continue their work. February 10th, 2001 B had asked some of his other caving friends what the noises that they were hearing might be. They suggested the sounds could be coming from an underground waterfall. This just intensified Ted and B's desire to get to the other side. On this trip, Whip, B's Jack Russell Terrier, joined the two cavers in their mission. This was not Whip's first time in caves, and B had a special harness that allowed them to lower her safely into Mystery Cave. The plan was to put Whip into the small hole to see how far she would go to find out just how far the passage went. After the party had reached the final landing and proceeded toward the hole, Whip began sniffing around. She ran from side to side, excited by all the new smells, and when they reached the chamber where the four tunnels were located, something strange began to happen. Whip entered the chamber and her demeanor immediately changed. She became skittish and would not leave Ted and B's side. It was as if Whip could sense something was wrong. As they approached the hole, the hair on the ridge of Whip's back stood on end. The dog began to growl, then her tail went between her legs and she began to whimper. Whip seemed to be scared of something lurking in the darkness. Ted and B got to work on the hole while Whip lay on the rope bag. She would whimper every now and then and refuse to approach the hole. In hindsight, Ted remembered that while they were working, Whip didn't take her eyes off the hole. It was as if she was waiting for something to come out of it, and from how scared she was, it wouldn't be anything good. B had just finished drilling and was going to chisel away some rock when he froze. He had a puzzled look on his face, so Ted asked him what was up. B shook his head and held his flashlight up so he could see down the shaft. He told Ted he had heard a strange noise. It sounded like rock grinding against a rock. They both shrugged it off and figured it would just be another mystery they'd solve once they got through the hole. When the last battery died, Ted looked at the hole. He was positive he could fit his head through it. He was right. Both of the cavers laughed with a joy. They'd made some serious progress. When Ted went silent, B asked what was wrong, to which Ted responded that the wind had stopped blowing. Both of them remembered the wind howling when they started digging earlier, but couldn't remember when it stopped. The stillness filled the air as Ted noticed that the low rumbling had also ceased. They seemed to be uncovering more mysteries than answers the further they got along. March 3rd, 2001 Due to scheduling conflicts, Ted and B hadn't been back to the cave in three weeks. B left Whip at home this time for obvious reasons. When they reached the hole, both of them noticed the breeze had resumed blowing and the rumbling was back. They continued working for several hours until they were on their final battery. This was when they heard the most terrifying sound of their lives. The drill was whirring down when a blood-curling scream emanated out of the hole. 
It echoed down the cavern as Ted stared wide-eyed at the opening. He turned to look at B, who had been napping but was now sitting straight up with his mouth agape. What the hell was that? They asked one another. Ted turned back toward the hole. In the back of his mind, he expected to find a demonic face peering at him through the hole, but all he could see was darkness. He shone his light down the tunnel looking for any movement, but nothing was there. B scrambled toward the hole and told Ted to shove rocks into the opening. He thought that maybe there was an animal on the other side of the hole that somehow got trapped down there. The two cavers loaded the hole with rocks to keep whatever was on the other side from coming through the hole. They waited for several minutes to see if anything would happen. No other sounds could be heard. Eventually, they decided it'd be okay to get back to work, but they would both keep an eye on the hole for any signs of movement. They'd come so far, and they couldn't let their imagination stop them. The urge to discover the virgin cave was just too great. The sound was probably just echoes within the cave playing tricks on them. They removed the rocks that they'd shoved into the hole. It was after the last rock came out that Ted noticed the wind had stopped blowing and the rumbling noise had gone silent. March 4, 2001 The two cavers climbed eagerly back into the cave, all but forgetting the terrifying scream from the day before. The breeze and rumbling were both back. After a few hours of working, B let out a cheer. When he turned around, Ted could see a relatively large section of rock had come off and now looked like the hole was big enough for him to climb through. It would be an incredibly tight fit, but Ted was almost positive he could squeeze his body into it. Ted wiggled his body into the hole. The rocks scraped at his skin from all sides, but he could fit. Ted continued into the tomb and found that the shaft began to close in around him as he got further. His hips cleared the entrance and he continued to wiggle forward. Ted couldn't really see what was in front of him, as the only way to continue through Floyd's tomb was to keep his head tilted to the side. When he was fully within the shaft, Ted decided to be a good time to make sure he could get back out. B tied ropes to his feet and helped pull him back if he got stuck. He had come so far, and Ted needed to know if he could reach the end of Floyd's tomb and come out the other side. Ted continued to crawl forward as the passageway got smaller and smaller. By the end, he could barely move. His body became wedged between the rocks. The only way to continue was to exhale all of the air in his lungs to reduce the size of his chest cavity. By doing this, he'd be able to squeeze through if they could remove a few more rocks. Ted crawled back through the shaft and came out smiling at B. He explained that it was possible for him to get through and all they needed was to scrape the edges of the passageway in order for him to get to the other side. B was elated. April 7, 2001 Ted and B returned to Mystery Cave with a homemade scraping tool that Ted's neighbor had helped him weld together. Once they were in the cave, B used it to clear the rock walls and Floyd's tomb of any protrusions. When they were both satisfied that the walls were now smooth enough for Ted to get all the way through, he entered. Ted knew that this was it. He didn't even bother tying the rope to his feet. Ted shimmied his way through the shaft using the method from the previous attempt. Exhale, scoot, stop to breathe, repeat. Ted reached the end, where it began to open up. He yelled back to B that he was almost there. Beer cheered him on. Virgin passage, Neil Armstrong territory, he shouted. Then it happened. Ted's head popped out into the virgin cave. He'd done it. They both celebrated on opposite sides of Floyd's tomb. A somber feeling came over Ted as he realized that since B was a bigger guy, he'd never be able to make it through the narrow passageway. Ted did his best to describe what he was seeing as he scanned the new cave system with his flashlight. B threw a rope through Floyd's tomb, which Ted could grab and pull his gear through the shaft with. Once he had his helmet and camera, Ted took a picture to show B later on. However, if Ted got into trouble, there'd be no way for B to get to him. They decided that Ted would explore the new cave system but would stay within shouting distance in case something went wrong. Ted headed down the passage yelling back at B every now and then to make sure he could hear him. The walls looked similar to Mystery Cave. Ted had only made it a few hundred feet before he could no longer hear B. The tunnel seemed to be going on forever. Both Ted and B were desperate to find out what other secrets this cave held. They decided that Ted would go off and explore on his own for half an hour. If something happened and Ted didn't return after the allotted time, B would head to the surface and get help. As Ted headed deeper into the darkness of the cave, the tunnels began to open up. He could now stand and move freely. The first really interesting formation he came across was a set of crystals embedded in the cave wall. He continued on and the tunnel opened up into a larger chamber. It was here that Ted came across the most surprising find yet. At the end of this room was a large round rock that was propped up against the wall. Ted was able to take a picture of the entrance of the chamber where the leaning stone could be seen coming out of the darkness. As Ted entered the chamber with the large egg-shaped rock in it, he began to feel uneasy. He'd had the feeling someone was watching him. Once he was in the room, he saw another tunnel on the far side. An overwhelming sense of being alone washed over Ted as he stood in the cave. His half hour was almost up, so he turned to head back to B when something caught his eye. On one of the walls, there were drawings. It was clear that the diagrams were ancient. The pictogram consisted of a group of people standing below some unknown symbol, raising their hands up in exultation. 
Ted snapped a quick photo and rushed back toward Floyd's tomb, excited to tell B about everything he found. Not only was this an amazing discovery, but the drawings meant there was another way into this section of the cave. Ted got back into the hole and spewed words out at B. He was so excited and talked so fast that B had to tell him to relax and slow down. Ted took a breath and told B about everything he found. Then Ted passed his gear back through the shaft. Once it was clear and B gave him a go-ahead, Ted entered Floyd's tomb head first and began to crawl back toward B, who took a picture of him. As Ted made his way back through the shaft, he heard a sound coming from behind him. It was faint and sounded like rock sliding on rock. Ted froze, trying to make out the sound and where it was coming from. Ted continued his journey forward and exited the shaft. He didn't say anything to B about the sound. A few days later, Ted got the pictures developed from his disposable camera. When he flipped through the images, he noticed something incredibly strange. All of the photos leading up to the large room with the rock leaning against the wall came out great, but any pictures taken in the room itself were blank. April 14, 2001 It was decided that in order for the Virgin Cave to be properly explored, Ted and B would need to bring in someone else. They recruited a fellow caver named Joe. Joe was an experienced caver and had a very thin frame. This made him ideal for making it through Floyd's tomb and entering the Virgin Cave. The three cavers entered and descended the hole leading to the new chamber. Ted and B did not tell Joe about the weird things they experienced previously in the cave as they didn't see any benefit to doing so. Joe and Ted entered the hole and made it into the next section of the cave. B passed the gear through, and as Ted went to grab his stuff, he slammed his head against the cave wall. His head throbbed. B sent the first aid kit through the passage, but Ted didn't feel so good. He likely had a concussion. Ted wouldn't be able to explore the cave that day, but he still wanted Joe to see what he had found in the big room at the end of the tunnel. Ted told Joe to go on without him and informed him to keep an eye out. Ted waited until Joe's light disappeared and then went back through the shaft to hang out with B until Joe got back. Time went by and Joe didn't return. B began yelling Joe's name, but there was no response. Ted prepared to go back through Floyd's tomb to go search for Joe. Suddenly a light shone out through the end of the tunnel. Joe? Ted called out. Are you okay? No, was the only reply that Joe gave. Joe climbed through the shaft and exited. He was ghost white and said he didn't feel so well. Ted and B asked him what happened, but Joe ignored them and headed for the cave's exit. Ted and B quickly gathered up all their equipment and followed Joe. When they exited, Joe walked straight to the car and got in. All Joe said was that he felt terrible and wanted to go home. When Ted asked Joe if he heard them yelling or if he saw the egg-shaped rock, Joe told him no. When they dropped Joe off at his house, Ted and B told him they were going to go back to the cave at some point and asked if he wanted to go with him. Joe shook his head turned toward his house and went inside without saying another word. April 28, 2001 Ted and B tried to check in on Joe, but he wouldn't answer his phone or open his door for anyone. They decided they had to go back into the cave and continue exploring it for answers. Before entering the cave, Ted and B informed a local cave rescue group of what they were doing in case anything went wrong. They were given a two-way phone that connected via a thin wire. This would allow B and Ted to stay in constant communication as Ted explored the Virgin Cave system. When Ted and B entered the cave that day, it was clear something didn't want them there. Nothing went smoothly. Knots had to be retied and clips kept breaking. Eventually, they got to the hole. This time, Ted had brought a video camera with him, which he would bring into the cave to document everything he saw. He climbed through Floyd's tomb and had B pass him all of his gear and one of the two-way telephones. As Ted walked down the Virgin Cave's dark tunnels, he unspooled the phone's wire. Every few minutes, he'd pick up the receiver and talk to B so they both knew that everything was alright. Ted reached the room with the large rock. As soon as he entered the chamber, he began to feel strange. He looked around the room and saw nothing out of place, so he continued toward the far side of the room to enter the next tunnel. The entire time he'd been traveling through the cave, he'd been recording using the video camcorder. The new passage somehow appeared darker than the rest of the cave. It was as if it consumed any light that entered it. Ted took a deep breath and proceeded into the tunnel. As he stepped forward, shards of broken rock cracked under his feet. He made it several feet into the passageway when he heard a noise. It was the sound of rock scraping against rock. It was coming from the large room that he had just come from. Startled by the sound, Ted stood up abruptly and slammed his helmet against the solid rock ceiling. This caused him to crumple to the ground in pain. The impact damaged the light on top of his helmet. He sat in complete darkness for a moment before scrambling through his bag to find his emergency glow sticks. He was afraid to crack them because of what the green glow might reveal. But there was no other choice. If he was going to get out of here, he needed to see. Ted cracked the glow stick and strained to see what was moving in the other room. Nothing was there. Ted scrambled to pick up the phone and whispered into it for B to pick up, but the line was dead. Ted was paralyzed with fear, but something might have happened to B. He mustered what little courage he had left, cracked another glow stick, and threw it into the room to help illuminate it. 
The glow stick rolled across the ground and circled behind the large rock that had been leaning against the wall. When the glow stick rolled behind it, the light seemed to disappear. Ted hadn't seen anything in the room, but that didn't really reassure him. Either way, he needed to get back to B. Ted slowly stood up and followed the phone wire back the way he came. He could only see a few feet in front of him using his glow sticks and a small backup lamp he had in his bag. When Ted reached the part of the chamber with the cave art, the symbol seemed to glow. He moved on, continuing to follow the cord of the phone. This led him toward a large stone. As he approached, Ted noticed something strange. The rock seemed to have shifted. Then, it all clicked. That scraping sound he'd heard was this large rock being moved. A flood of terror filled his body. Someone or something was in the cave with him. When he reached the rock, he noticed it was now sitting directly on the phone wire. It had severed the cord in two, which is why he couldn't reach B. Ted peered over the rock to see where the glow stick had gone. Where the stone once rested was a deep, dark hole. The rock had acted like a door that had been shut, but now the gateway was open. Ted shrieked in horror and began moving as fast as he could away from the chamber and toward Floyd's tomb. As he crouched and proceeded down the passageways, he banged and scraped his body into the jagged rocks. Ted was too afraid to turn around but he couldn't help but imagine a legion of demons pursuing him through the tunnels. He reached the point where he could yell to B. Ted screamed his name. B asked if he was alright. Ted just shouted for him to get out of the cave as fast as he could. Ted reached Floyd's tomb and shoved his gear into the hole. It was at this point he realized that he had dropped the video camera when he slammed his head into the ceiling of the tunnel. For a split second, Ted thought about going back for it. But then, the fear overcame him, and he began to crawl through the shaft toward B. As he snaked forward, he could see that B was just starting to head down the tunnel toward the exit. Then, Ted smelled something awful wafting into the passage behind him. It smelt like decaying, rotting, putrid death. The smell was overpowering, and Ted began to gag. He continued to crawl as fast as he could, trying to get out of the tomb and away from the smell. Ted popped out of the hole and rolled to the ground. He was in so much pain he could barely breathe, but as he lay there, he could hear a scraping sound coming from the other side of the hole. Ted scrambled onto his feet and ran after B. B had already begun ascending the ropes toward the top of the cave. Ted had no time to harness up or clip in, so he began to free climb. If he lost his grip, he would plummet to his death. Ted and B vigorously climbed toward the entrance of the cave. Ted caught up to his friend on the final ledge. The smell of death had followed them toward the exit of the cave. Ted watched as B made the final climb to the mouth of the cave. Then he heard a strange sound like a zipper unzipping. He looked down at his feet and noticed that the excess rope was being pulled back into the cave. Something in the darkness was trying to drag them back in. Ted let out a scream and then scrambled up the rope. Just as he reached the top, he felt the rope go taut. Whatever was in the blackness was almost upon him. Ted looked up in terror. B leaned over and pulled him over the ledge. They lay on the ground outside the mouth of the cave when the tree next to them began to creak. The rope they'd climbed up was moving back and forth as if something else was using it to climb out of the cave. B jumped to his feet, pulled out his pocket knife and began cutting the rope. It frayed as Ted pleaded with B to hurry. Then the rope snapped and fell back into the blackness of the cave and disappeared. They both sat there staring at the cave opening. After an unknown amount of time, they stood up, walked to the truck and drove away. Neither one said a word the whole way home. May 19th, 2001. Ted wrote a message to his readers. He wanted to update everyone on how he was doing after his last post. Many people reached out to him, but he just didn't have the time to respond until now. He'd been having nightmares and had been seeing things in the night. There was a shadowy figure that seemed to be following him around and noises that he could not explain. Then one night, he had an overwhelming urge to drive to Overlook Point, where he could see the city lights. Some unknown force was pulling him there. When he arrived, he noticed another car parked at the Overlook with a dark figure leaning against the hood of the car. When Ted pulled up and exited his vehicle, he found that the person was Joe. When Joe saw Ted, he just nodded. It was clear that they'd experienced similar encounters in the cave. They only said a few words. We need to return. Tomorrow good? Ted asked. Yeah, noon, Joe replied. Ted nodded, and they both got back in their cars and drove away. Ted headed to B's house next. They hadn't talked since their experience in Mystery Cave. Ted knocked on B's door. When he opened it, he welcomed Ted in. It was a little awkward, but Ted got straight to the point. I just ran into Joe, and we're going back in tomorrow at noon. B said nothing. He just nodded his head. He offered for Ted to stay the night so they could head out together the next day. The post ends by telling the reader that Ted, Joe, and B would already have left for Mystery Cave by the time anyone read the message. They wanted to find out what happened after they last saw the cave. Would they be able to recover the video camera and see what was on it? And if they went back into the cave, would they make it back out? Ted wrote that the reason they were going back was to find some sort of closure. He left the reader with this final thought. For my family and friends who are reading this, I say, be at peace. I will conquer this cave. Then I will return and update this website immediately. I will include any photos we take in the cave today, and if you stop by the house, I'll show you the video I have. 
I expect to be home later tonight or tomorrow at the latest. See all of you soon with a lot of answers. Love, Ted. So, what did Ted the Caver find? Is this a true story, and where is the cave? After some deep digging, some of these questions can be answered. In this story, Ted hypothesizes the monster they encountered was an ancient creature called a hodag. There's no evidence that this creature exists, but it could be one explanation. Some believe that the Ted the Caver story was plagiarized by Ted from a short story titled The Fear of Darkness by Thomas Lyra. However, it's now widely accepted by the internet community that it was actually the other way around. Ted's story was the original and Lyra was the one who plagiarized and fabricated an earlier publication date. The two stories are almost identical except for a few details. The most promising evidence for where Ted the Caver story came from comes from a post in a caver forum by Ted himself, or at least someone who claims to be Ted. This person states that he wrote the story and then gives a number of details about the characters who were based on real people in his life. He then has these people corroborate the story. If we are to believe that this person really is Ted, and that the people who support his claims are really the people in the story, then the answer to the question, is Ted the Caver a true story, is no. The person claiming to be Ted said that Mystery Cave exists and even explained exactly where it was. The cave is called Interstate Cave or Freeway Cave and is part of the Timpanogos Cave Network in Utah. The person who wrote the post says that the freeway that runs over these caves creates creepy sounds that reverberate through the chambers. This is what inspired the story. The hole was real and Ted and his friend did carve it out so they could explore further into the cave system, but that's where the truth ends. There was no creature, they did not need to run for their lives. If we're to believe the poster is Ted, the cave is real, the rumbling is real, and everything else is fake. However, there are those who believe that this post was created to hide the truth about what Ted the Caver found and that there's a deep dark secret hiding somewhere in a cave system in the United States. Now watch Smile Dog Creepy Pasta Explained, or check out Monster Stalks Your Nightmares Jeff the Killer Explained, short animated film 